Six days have passed since the death of Her Majesty the Queen and as London prepares to host the first state funeral in nearly 60 years, another important event in the period of national mourning is about to take place this afternoon. Now overnight in the Bow Room, which is a grand room overlooking the gardens of Buckingham Palace, the late Queen's coffin has been lying at rest, ready for today's state procession to Westminster Hall and the lying in state over the coming days. The word state is very important because this is the day when the royal household transfers responsibility in a way to the state for the events to come. It's a reflection, of course, of the status of the event in terms of the monarch's passing. Now, the procession will make its way along the Mall, which is decked in Union flags, and uh, they'll make their way to Whitehall and to Parliament Square. Uh, this is the ceremonial route, of course, travelled so many times by the Queen on very happy occasions, including jubilees and birthday parades, and, uh, of course, in sadder times as well, including the funerals of her father and mother, whose statues dominate one section of the Mall on this ceremonial route. Now, for four days and nights, the ancient space of Westminster Hall, which is a thousand years old, will be the setting for the lying in state and the solemn vigil to be witnessed probably by vast numbers of people, uh, all converging on central London in recent days, eager to pay their last respects to a much loved and respected monarch. Our afternoon's coverage, which will of course be following all the events right up until the service, the religious service in Westminster Hall a little later on before the lying in state begins. Our coverage begins with our special guest today, uh, Sir David Attenborough, the distinguished broadcaster, and Dame Darcy Bussell, the equally distinguished ballerina, writer, author and broadcaster too. Thank you both for coming in. Nice to see you. Um, David, first of all, I mentioned the fact that this is really the opening of the state process. Uh, we are suddenly seeing central London as part of this very formal, very planned ceremonial process. And it's impressive, isn't it? It's impressive to see it unfold. Very much so, and impressive to find so many people here. And of course, the, I mean, there's a, a village here, in effect. I mean, ready for great numbers of people who have to be looked after, have to be provided with food and one thing or another, but also the sheer density of people and coming from all over the place, from foreign shores as well as from all parts of Britain. And uh, it is enormously impressive just, just to come here. When you think of the Queen's contribution, a lifetime of service, dedication, solid sense of duty, how important is it for us to be recognising all of those qualities and values as we witness all the ceremonial events going on in front of us? Um, I think what is evident is the, the affection um, displayed by so many people from so many parts of the world, not just of this country, but all over the place. Um, and uh, people are wandering around and there's a, a, there's a, a sense of, of communal attitude, as it were, yeah. that we all are focused on the same event yeah. uh, that happened uh, a week ago 
and and we are all in this particular state of suspension in between the final act. You're quite right, David, because of course we see lots of the people there waiting patiently along the Mall, uh, and uh, the crowds, of course, will grow over the days ahead. And Darcy, from your point of view, having met the Queen uh, quite a few occasions, to put it mildly, um, having danced for her, um, indeed having danced within the same uh, space as her, as we understand as well, um, what would you say about the Queen that you met and the Queen that you got to know? Well, I suppose what hits me straight away is probably one of the most hard-working women I've ever known, actually. Um, I think, you know, just having a small amount of pressure on my shoulders of being in the public eye, and but to think that all her working life, all these 70 years of reign, that she's had a camera on her every minute. And that, I just, and I, I mean, of course, the respect and the amount of work that she goes in to meet so many people and make them feel so valued uh, and understood it is extraordinary. It's really extraordinary. I mean, every time I've met her, um, she's been so personal and so uh, so real and very frank. And I really uh, respect that, that she can just speak very calmly to you and not be, sorry, what, what is it you do again? And I was like, no, no, no. She's always yes. totally yes. on it. And, and uh, but curious as well, which is really lovely. So. Um, well, I think everyone here today, and certainly those uh, in the, the surrounding parks and up towards Horse Guards Parade, uh, are aware in a gentle way of the kind of woman that she was mm. um, because of course that's a separate judgment to the kind of queen that she was because we're talking about yeah. two different things the personality which wasn't always evident um, but of course the formality mm. which for the most part was always evident and as we look at these scenes Darcy maybe you can share with us um, maybe just one experience of meeting the queen and um, how that how that came about and yeah. what were your impressions really most of all? Um, well, it's quite cheeky, quite fun. I mean, there's, there's lots of little stories where I've, I've come across her. I think um, one of them when you mentioned about being on the same dance floor as her, which is pretty unusual. I, I was going to Windsor Castle for a very big celebration of four royal birthdays and I think it's quite a while back. Um, uh, Queen's hundreds. Um, I've got to get this right, the uh, 70th of um, Princess Margaret, yes. the 40th of Prince Andrew, yeah. and I think the 18th of Prince William. And it was an odd occasion to be invited to, I, you know, and a lot of people were going to it. And I remember coming through the doors with my husband and the Queen greeted us. And I was like, gosh, I wasn't expecting that. And she said straight away, she went, now I think um, there's either some roadworks or there's been a crash on the motorway because there's not many people here. So just so you know, it is going to fill up, you know, that kind of yes. like, oh, just not what you're expecting <laughs> to be greeted by the Queen. And, and obviously her concern that the party hadn't started fully. Um, but then as it started, and it was a nice relaxed affair. Um, it was a buffet more and there was dancing. And I, me and my husband were on the dance floor. And then you suddenly realise that the Queen is dancing behind you. And I was like, oh, OK. Don't want to bump into the Queen. And then we'd walked into another room and uh, sat down by a seat and then suddenly realised the Queen was sat next to us in another seat. And she said, um, she said, are you following me? Like that. And I went, oh, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not really. I promise you, I'm not trying to follow you. <laughs> just by a coincidence. Um, but yeah, just, she, you know, cheeky and, yes. and fun. And putting people at ease. Yes, exactly, yes. Yes. exactly. Yes. And it was a lovely occasion, yeah. David, we'll come for some of your memories in a moment, if <laughs> we may. Um, because ever since the Queen's death was announced at half past six last Thursday evening, writers and commentators have seemingly been competing to produce the most impressive historical parallels. And yet the simple facts are, of course, impressive enough. Uh, a 70 year reign, 15 prime ministers, 15 US presidents, seven popes, all within the compass of the reign. Uh, literally hundreds of national leaders have met the Queen. There will be millions of members of the public at home and overseas who also shared that special experience.
When I was 21, I pledged my life to the service of our people, and I asked for God's help to make good that vow. Although that vow was made in my salad days when I was green in judgment, I do not regret nor attract one word of it. Very poignant images there, and there we have the empty balcony today uh, as we await the start of this state procession uh, bearing the Queen's body from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall. But this, of course, uh, the scene of so many celebrations in the past and the vast crowds here on the day of the birthday parade in June and that great fly pass, of course, by the Royal Air Force, including the Red Arrows. How many times have we seen it? And every time the Queen was there smiling broadly. The Royal Standard flying because King Charles III is in residence uh, at Buckingham Palace. The Royal Standard there proudly telling the world that uh, the King is present and of course the King will be part of the procession today. Uh, so let me give you a little guide to the events of the afternoon because that'll help us understand how they might unfold as the afternoon goes on. In around an hour's time, maybe just a little more than that, um, the procession will begin. Uh, it will accompany the Queen's coffin, it'll leave Buckingham Palace, uh, it'll make its way along the Mall, it'll be a gun carriage drawn by the riders of the King's troop, Royal Horse Artillery, past Clarence House and St James's Palace, and then it will make its way solemnly and slowly uh, down the approach to Horse Guards and the scene of so many jubilant birthday parades over the years. And through Horse Guards Arch, along Whitehall, past the Cenotaph where the Queen for decades has led the nation's remembrance, into Parliament Square, into New Palace Yard, and then into the Palace of Westminster, the most ancient part of which is Westminster Hall, which miraculously survived all of the damage of the Second World War. And uh, Westminster Hall, a thousand years old, is the location of the lying in state. That is where we will see the service a little later on, and that is where the Queen's coffin will be received. And then the vigils will begin, and then members of the public eventually will be able to come in and file past, and we'll have full coverage of the Day's events. Um, more special guests joining me later, of course, and if you'd like unaccompanied coverage, you can have that as well. You can use the service on the red button too. 
Well, now, a short while ago, the King's Troop uh, Royal Horse Artillery made their way to Hyde Park, where throughout the duration of the procession, they will be firing the minute guns. That will be happening there. That will be a very solemn part of the day's beat, if you like. Uh, we'll also have the great bell of Big Ben uh, sounding every minute, and we'll have some of the military bands contributing as well. Here we are at Wellington Barracks, and we have the uh, Guards of Honour ready to step off in a short while. And uh, there, too, is my colleague and uh, former serviceman, J.J. Chalmers. Servicemen and women of the armed forces are conducting their final checks as they begin to file out here onto the parade square at Wellington Barracks. All three services will be on parade today, the Army, the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force. At its very heart will be the Household Division, who of course are the Queen's bodyguard. The Queen, well, she was the Colonel-in-Chief. She was our boss. Ultimately, she will now be carried on this gun carriage from her final resting in Buckingham Palace, her home, up the Mall, and she will be surrounded by armed forces personnel who feel a very personal connection to her. Just as the crowds have gathered to pay their respects, this is how the armed forces show their respect, by conducting their duty in the most difficult of circumstances, because that's what she would have done, and ultimately she led by example. Now, make no mistake, the individuals wearing these uniforms today are human beings. They will feel the emotion of today. They will feel it in every step they take. They will feel it in every order they receive. But they will conduct it with the utmost professionalism. JJ, many thanks. And there they are, the dismounted detachments of the uh, lifeguards and the Blues and Royals, the Household Cavalry, uh, waiting as smartly and as crisply as ever uh, for this very solemn duty that they have this afternoon. Um, and not far away, really big numbers of crowds, they're swelling now along the Mall, and my colleague Sophie Rayworth is there too. Yes, you look at all these people here, huge crowds that have gathered right around Buckingham Palace. And if you uh, look down here as well, you get a real sense of just how many people are out here lining the Mall. Some people have camped out here all night. They braved the rain last night and stayed out here. Others have arrived about four hours ago and taken up their places, front row places, so that they will be able to see the procession as it goes past. And I've been talking to lots of the people here. They've come from all over, all over the United Kingdom, of course, but all over the world as well. There are people from Kansas City, a woman from Ukraine, a woman from Canada, somebody from Australia, and two women who flew in from the west coast of America yesterday. And when I asked them why they had come just for today, they said it was because their father had always grown up with the Queen, he loved the Queen, and he's too ill to come himself, so he asked them to come for him. Now, once the procession has passed, a lot of people here are planning to move away from the palace and head down towards the river and go and join that queue on the other side of the River Thames so that they can take part and file past the Queen's coffin and say one final farewell. Sophie, they will be joined by so many people, I'm sure of that, and the, uh, the queue for the filing past will be, well, really miles long, potentially four or five miles long, we shall see, but uh, we think that the interest is clearly going to be uh, intense. And as the longest serving monarch in British history, uh, the Queen, of course, over the course of the years met many world leaders and many serving and former leaders have sent messages of condolence over the past six days and some are due to attend the lying in state and the state funeral on Monday. Um, one of those who's been paying tribute is the former US President Barack Obama who made uh, several visits uh, to the UK and has shared his very fond memories of the Queen. The first time that I uh, met the Queen was visiting London, she reminded me very much of my grandmother, <laughs> which uh, surprised me, not just in appearance, but also in manner. Very gracious, but also no nonsense. Wry sense of humor. She could not have been more kind uh, or thoughtful to, to me and Michelle. Shortly thereafter, Michelle and Malia and Sasha, my two daughters, uh, had occasion to go back uh, to England. Buckingham Palace reached out and uh, Her Majesty had invited Michelle and 
the two girls to tea. She had then offered uh, the girls to drive in her golden carriage around the grounds of Buckingham Palace. Uh, it, it was the sort of uh, generosity uh, and uh, consideration that left a mark uh, in my daughter's lives uh, uh, that, uh, that's still there. The queen was an excellent listener. She had a genuine curiosity, although she was uh, impatient to get to the point. This is in 2011, and we had been invited to a state dinner at Buckingham Palace. State dinners at Buckingham Palace, a little different than state dinners everywhere else. The queen was dressed up quite a bit for the state dinner, <laughs> and uh, it was a little bit uh, concerning for Michelle because as a gift, to uh, Her Majesty, uh, Michelle had selected a small, modest uh, brooch of nominal value. We reciprocated the following evening with a dinner that we hosted at uh, the American Embassy. But the one thing we immediately notice is that she's wearing the brooch that Michelle had given. And it was an example of the subtle uh, thoughtfulness uh, that she consistently displayed, not just to us, but to uh, everybody who she interacted with. She was very mindful of uh, guests at Buckingham Palace not overstaying their welcome. She was looking at her watch and at some point said, well, okay, it's time to go. And uh, the same was true uh, as a guest. She wasn't interested in overstaying her welcome. She looked at her, at her watch at a certain point and said, all right, uh, I, I think we need to wrap this up. The combination of a sense of duty and a, a clear understanding of her role uh, as a symbol for a nation and as the carrier of a certain set of values uh, combined with a, a very human quality of, of kindness and consideration, um, I, I think that's what made her so beloved, not just uh, in Great Britain, but uh, uh, around the world. Some uh, lovely recollections there from the former US President uh, Barack Obama, and a bit of a sense of mischief coming out in lots of these tributes. The Queen was someone who, yes, of course, had a, a real sense of presence and formality, but, you know, behind the scenes, liked a bit of a giggle about some things and liked to tease people as well. Uh, let's go back to Sir David and uh, Dame Darcy. Um, of course, in your long career, uh, David, you've been you know, a broadcaster on screen, but you've also been somebody who's been running things behind the scenes. Um, and one of the things, of course, the BBC was involved with for decades was the Christmas broadcast. Um, how did that work out in terms of dealing with the palace and the Queen? Well, well the first time I did it, I did it for, I think, eight, nine years. And the first time I did it, I was very apprehensive. Uh, and particularly when I discovered that uh, there was going to be a planning meeting at which the Queen herself wanted to take part. And his uh, her private secretary, a marvellous down-to-earth Australian called Bill Heseltine, Sir William Heseltine, was also there. And uh, so we had a meeting with the Queen to discuss this. Uh, and the Queen said, um, what about costume? What, what, what do you recommend? I mean, would this do? Now, we had just selected the room in which it was going to take place. And the trouble was that her costume was green, but the room in which we were going to do it was also got a green wallpaper. So very apprehensively, I mean, it's my first time, you know, I said, well, uh, <clears throat> could we possibly have it changed a different colour? And she said, what is wrong with that colour? <laughs> and I said, uh, <clears throat> well, no, it um, <laughs> matches the wallpaper, uh, and I think it would not look good. And Bill has a time hoping to help, said, uh, I mean, it was either that yes. or getting the rule repapered. Yes. yes. And she said, <laughs> repapered? Have you any idea what that's going to cost? <laughs> and so I thought I'd help Bill, said she did not help me. I said, I think that was Sir William's little joke. Mm. Maybe, she said, but not a very good one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's insights like that, um, because it's 
really she was making a more serious point, which was, of course, how could I help the production? Yes, it did. That was the point. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. She was perfectly, very anxious to uh, yeah. help in whatever way yeah. he could, yes. Darcy, in, in one sense about the idea of a role model, mm. which is a ridiculously complex idea in one way, yes. because of course when somebody's been on the throne for 70 years, the, the sense of being a role model changes as yeah. well. Um, but as a woman, mm. uh, the most prominent woman in the world probably, mm. uh, who since the early 50s, a very different world, uh, was someone who carried a responsibility, what is your sense of her contribution as a role model? Well, you just gain so much strength from it, don't you? I mean, just to think that she came at such a young age, such a young age, and how daunting that would have been. And, and I only have two daughters, and I just think of everything they're starting off doing. And to think that there is our queen, starting at such a young age with such responsibility on her shoulders, the history and everything, and, and what she was taking on, and her great resilience and her um, I suppose her strength that I think was most inspiring as a, as a young dancer as well. Um, it, you know, overwhelming, really. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, there we have the scene at Wellington Barracks, which is just a few yards away from Buckingham Palace. But uh, we have the dismounted detachments of the Lifeguards and Blues and Royals, and we have the 1st Battalion Coldstream Guards also as part of the formalities today and the, providing the uh, King's Guard today uh, and they will be one of three guards provided uh, one in the Queen's Garden opposite the palace and then one at Horse Guards and the other in Parliament Square. Let's join my colleague Fergal Keane. We've come through days of journeys each representing a final goodbye to places where the Queen was loved and which she loved. Here at Wellington Barracks the troops of the Household Division the monarch's personal guards since 1660 are about to make the short journey to Buckingham Palace from where they'll accompany the Queen's coffin to Westminster Hall for her lying in state. This cortege includes troops from the lifeguards and blues and royals, the King's Guard, the Guard of Honour, and a bearer party from the first Grenadier Guards. All will march to the bands of the Grenadier Guards and the Scots Guards. This will be the Queen's final departure from Buckingham Palace, from where she witnessed the celebrations on VE Day after the defeat of Nazi Germany in 1945, and where, this June, she acknowledged the crowd celebrating 70 years of her reign. We're seeing the marching detachments of the lifeguards and blues and royals, marching now through the gates of Wellington Barracks. Household cavalry are marching, they're on foot, not for symbolic reasons, but purely aesthetic, so that they don't in any sense distract from or overshadow the gun carriage.
the Queen personally gave the household cavalry dispensation to march in boots rather than their stiff jack boots that they use for riding, which can be challenging to walk in. And the lifeguards and the Blues and Royals are the two most senior regiments in the British Army. And now the bearer party, formed by the Queen's Company 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards, departs Wellington Barracks. And these are the King's Guard of Honour. And these are from the King's Guard of Honour, the 1st Battalion of the Coldstream Guards, the oldest continuously serving regiment in the British Army. Her Majesty had a special relationship with the Grenadier Guards as she was appointed Colonel-in-Chief on her 16th birthday. My colleague JJ Chalmers is at Wellington Barracks. I'm with Lieutenant Colonel James Shaw, who is the Brigade Major. So you've been in your post for seven months now, but I, I would like to know... What is your job today? So two, two roles today. Firstly, making sure the day happens to plan, organising all the details. And secondly, I have the uh, honour of uh, marching in the procession. Ultimately, this is a ceremony that has been decades in the planning and, and many people will have been involved in that process. Uh, ultimately, many could have stepped into your role throughout, throughout the decades, but it's proudly fallen on your shoulders and the shoulders of those that you command. Uh, how, how are preparations to this point? Preparations are going really well. Everybody is working super hard. Uh, we've done a number of rehearsals and we're set and ready to go. Uh, I think viewers at home will notice a bit of a change of pace. It's not a slow march you're doing. You're going at 75 paces per minute. What's the significance of that? It means the procession moves with solemnity, dignity, and it will almost look like we're gliding along and it's the most dignified way we can move Her Majesty to Westminster Hall. Um, Ultimately, in my opinion, there's no greater um, privilege than to, to lead those in the armed forces. Uh, today, how proud of you will you be of, of those under your command? So proud. I know everybody just wants to give 100% and every person in the armed forces just wants to be the best they can be today. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So we have the 1st Battalion, Coldstream Guards, um, making their way across, and what a wonderful sight it is. Um, their tunics, uh, really bright scarlet in this uh, sunshine, in this day in mid-September. And of course, they are deeply proud of bearing their colour. It's the sovereign standard. Uh, the commanding officer is Lieutenant Colonel Frederick Wells, who is, uh, I understand, just um, 24 from West Sussex. So it's quite a responsibility for a young officer. The, the colour has been draped in black, in keeping with the full formality of the state occasion. And they're ready for the formal procession to begin in a few minutes time when the King's troop will bring the gun carriage which will bear the Queen's coffin all the way along the mall over to Westminster Hall. We're joined here in the studio but we'll still keep admiring these images. We're joined by William Shawcross, the distinguished author and biographer of the uh, Queen Mother. Uh, someone who's delved very deeply into the Royal Archives and who knows uh, the history of the Royal Family as well as anyone. Um, and Sir David is still with me. Um, William, thank you for joining us. It's uh, an um, honour. As we admire these images and the full glory of this state occasion, uh, it's solemn, but it's something to be admired as well. Of course. Um, what are your thoughts on what the day represents? 
the whole whole week represents the love that the Queen created in her own people, and uh, the gratitude. I think gratitude is a very important word for today and all of these days. Um, she, in her diamond jubilee, typically, with typical modesty, said, I'm very grateful to you for all you have done. Well, now we, as the people, are showing day after day, hour after hour, the gratitude that we have, correctly, in my view, for the extraordinary service and love that she's given this country. We're looking, of course, at the very close bond between the Queen and the uh, armed services, and that's been evident throughout the years, yes. uh, from when she was a, a young princess. Um, and especially so with the Grenadier Guards, yes. uh, who are very prominent today, taking a prominent role. So there's that bond. There is the bond with the military, there's the bond with the people. And so there are two bonds in evidence today because, of course, we have thousands of members of the public yes. lining the mall, and I suspect these crowds will swell in the days to come. How is it, do you think, possible for people to properly reflect and to assess the contribution the Queen made in 70 years of rule, because that's a huge thing to take on, as you would know, someone who's had to condense lots of things into elegantly written books on these subjects, but how do you condense the contribution? I think we feel it all around us. This is a remarkable country, it's a successful country. Churchill said of her right at the beginning of her reign, you are the splendid champion of our wise and kind, uh, the gleaming champion of our wise and kindly way of life. And that was a wonderful expression. And it, is, it, ha it was a wise and kindly way of life. And to the extent that that has continued, and it has, I think she, with her wise and kindly service and her Christian service, which is a crucial part of the way which she saw her life and, and the way she should, should, should represent herself and serve the country. As Sir David will know, her, many of her Christmas broadcasts deal very personally about her love of God and love of Christ. In, in, in the Millennium broadcast in the year 2000, she said the birth of Jesus is the real millennium. And she said, we, we, the Christianity shows itself in this country in the good done quietly by millions of men and women day in and day out through the centuries. And for me, the teaching of Christ and my own personal accountability before God provide a framework in which I try to live my life. And she always did have that framework. She, she learned to pray as a child advise her bed with her mother, who always prayed by her bed throughout her life, and Christianity was absolutely crucial to her. When the Queen asked you to write a biography of her mother, the Queen Mother, um, how did that, well, I nearly said negotiation, how did that discussion go? It, it happened because of the BBC, actually, because I did, in, 20 years ago, I did a program, a series of programs called Queen and Country yes. for, the, for the Golden Jubilee. And afterwards, they were looking to... Uh, the Queen Mother died just before Easter weekend that, that year, 2002, and um, the uh, official biography had to be written. And I, I spoke to people I knew at the palace saying, having done this series, I would love my name to be considered. And a year later, I had a letter from the palace saying, the Queen has asked me to invite you. And it was the most wonderful thing that had ever happened to me in my life, in my public life, apart from my family, of course. Yes. And uh, I, I spent the next six years in the Royal Archives reading all these fantastic letters um, of the Queen Mother and her children, and it was a joy, absolute joy. Thank you very much. Well, the procession is about to get underway. Let's join Fergal once again. Yeah, Wellington Barracks now, and the Grenadier Guards moving out towards Buckingham Palace, and now the gun carriage on which will be borne the coffin of Her Majesty the Queen. The George gun was used for the funeral ceremonies of Her Majesty's father, George VI, in 1952, and her mother, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, 50 years later, in 2002. The King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery Gun Carriage. They have six World War I era 13 pounder guns that were built between 1913 and 1918. The George gun is the only one that is a complete original.
the carriage now approaching the monument to Queen Victoria before moving around and into Buckingham Palace. Now we have the bands of the Grenadier Guards and the Scots Guards. They're led by Tony Williams, the director of music and officer commanding the Scots Guards band. They will be playing music from Chopin, Beethoven, and Felix Mendelssohn, who, during the 19th century, played three times for the royal family at Buckingham Palace. The senior drum major is Sergeant Neil Brocklehurst, who is a percussionist from the band of the Scots Guards. He will be the time beater. And now drawn up inside the forecourt of Buckingham Palace, detachments of the lifeguards and the blues and royals. And the King's Guard, the Guard of Honour, is already in position in front of Buckingham Palace Gate. It is a day when the sound, almost, of marching feet, of rolling wheels, speaks more than the words. And the crowds here, as I discovered walking through them earlier, people gathered together, a very diverse group thousands of people, with that sense of being part of something larger than themselves, one of these very rare moments in the life of a nation where there is this sense of a national binding together, in grief, of course, but also in gratitude. Young and old. And now the bands of the Grenadier Guards and the Scots Guards approaching Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace, of course, the Queen's home in London, but also this great edifice at the heart of the capital, which has been witness to the gathering together of the peoples of the United Kingdom in triumph and sorrow. It was bombed nine times in World War II.
So we have the procession which is beginning to form up and we caught a glimpse there of some of the senior military figures also arriving at the palace including the Major General commanding the Household Division uh, London District, Major General Christopher Geeker, who was speaking to us yesterday about all the plans uh, that they've been making over many years uh, for today's events and indeed for the events leading up to the uh, funeral itself. Uh, and of course he will be accompanied by other senior colleagues uh, who've had specific roles in preparing for today. And uh, the procession will get underway uh, in a few minutes time. Sir David Attenborough, William Shawcross are still with me. Um, Sir David, when people watch this this afternoon um, and they realise that this is the Queen's final departure from Buckingham Palace, uh, making the way to Westminster Hall before the funeral and then of course the final committal at Windsor, will the enormity of what's happening take a while to settle in. Do you think people are taking a while to actually realise what's happened over the course of the past week? I suppose so, um, but my, my sense is that they understand very well uh, the uh, enormity, to use your word, uh, of the occasion. Um, and there is um, a mixture of practicality, but also uh, solemnity, if not reverence. Yes. Um, amongst the crowd. Uh, the interesting thing to me is that if you're part of the crowd, you somehow want to communicate. Um, and the only, the only way you can communicate is, is that we have at our disposal is applause. Mm. Mm. And so I was rather shocked when the crowds were applauding as yes. the coffin passed. And yet that's the only way in which they could say anything, communicate anything. It was inevitable. Yeah. I mentioned the fact that you'd be in charge of Christmas broadcasts, but of course not the only broadcast that you made uh, in terms of the Queen and the Queen's presence. Um, the Queen Consort, by the way, uh, Sir David, just making her way to the palace. Um, the Queen Consort and other female members of the family, apart from the Princess Royal, that is, will be uh, travelling to Westminster Hall by car. Um, what we'll see is the King and his two brothers um, certainly processing behind the uh, gun carriage as it carries the coffin over to Westminster Hall. I was asking David about your experience of, in effect, working with Her Majesty um, on different forms of broadcast um, and how you perceived her to be in terms of her attitude to life and her attitude to how the world was uh, developing uh, for good and for ill. Um, how did she strike you as a person in terms of her engagement? Very practical. Uh, she wanted to know the practicability of this, that and the other and why you actually did it or why you preferred this way rather than that way. Um, and that was uh, rather testing, really, mm. uh, because you, if you <laughs> had suggested something that was just going on, as it were, off the top of your head, um, and, and she would immediately explain that, <laughs> make it clear that that was perhaps not very bright. Um, <laughs> it, was, um, it was quite a, a, a formidable occasion. Yeah. And yet, on the other hand, she was extremely good at being practical and down to earth. Mm. And um, reverential, she didn't require. Uh, she required honesty and practicability, I think, I hope. Thank you. Well, we've seen the gun carriage, of course, being taken into the um, precincts of Buckingham Palace. Uh, and shortly, the coffin will emerge on that gun carriage and be taken over to Westminster. Um, of course, the crowds are here wanting to enjoy the glory of the spectacle, um, despite the solemnity of the occasion. And Sophie can tell us a little more about that. It is so quiet out here, it's so still, so calm, eerily so, very dignified as well. There are thousands and thousands of people and you can hear hardly anything. Among the people out here in the crowds today are people who are from the charities, the organisations of which the Queen was a patron and I'm joined by Yolanda Clark, who is from Cruise Bereavement Support. Uh, you met the Queen not that long ago, didn't you? What was that like? Um, 
Hello, thank you, Sophie. So I met the Queen at the Cruise Bereavement Support's 60th anniversary at St James's Palace, and we had a lovely reception to say thank you to one of our, so many of our 4,000 volunteers who support the charity. Um, I met the Queen. I was presented to her, and before she came in the room. I smelt her perfume, which was exactly the same as my mother's perfume. So it made me, it threw me off and made me nervous. Um, and when I met her, I called her your Madge by accident. <laughs> but I did correct it and she smiled at me and with, she looked at me with those beautiful eyes and that warm smile. And it was just amazing. She was so compassionate. She heard my story. She listened to me and made me feel like I was the only person in the room. And the work that your charity, your organisation does is all about supporting people who are dealing with grief. And everyone is very struck by the reaction that people are having to the Queen's death. Some people are really surprised at just how emotional they do feel. Yeah, so grief hits you. We can't tell you how you're going to grieve. It hits you in surprising ways. I always liken grief to a two-year-old who's going through the naughty twos and doesn't know how to manage their emotions. That's what grief feels like. So it will, can bring up a multitude of emotions in people. So people will cry, never expected to. People will go quiet. They might be busy. There's a lot of reactions to grief that sometimes people don't realise is grief. And you have to think about the royal family inside Buckingham Palace right now, getting ready to leave the palace with the Queen's coffin for the last time. And that is a family who is going through that grief in a very, very public way. Yes, I mean, most of us get to mourn in private. So, you know, if we want to be under the duvet with the covers over our heads, we can do that. But the royal family have to take into account the nation in England and Wales and Northern Ireland, so they can't grieve the way they want to, and they're doing it in such a dignified way. So at this moment, they really need a lot of love, compassion and understanding. And the grief might even hit them later on, because at the moment, they're so busy. The king's going through transition. Even within the royal family, there's different titles. There's move, movements in residencies. So it's, I don't think that the grief has hit them yet so I'm very struck yeah. by the atmosphere here I can hear little birds cheeping yeah. above us here <laughs> there are tens and thousands of people yeah. and it's so still isn't yeah. it it is still but that just shows that's a reflection of the respect that people have for Her Majesty the Queen and the Queen herself was dignified and quiet so it's quite it's fitting that the people that have come are showing her that respect in that way Yolanda Clark thank you so much Themes that we are very familiar with, themes of uh, interest and engagement and dedication to good causes. Um, we'll be talking to more people, of course, uh, who are lining the mall uh, in a short while, um, ahead of the carriage procession itself, which is due to begin within half an hour, because uh, there are lots of preparations to be made now inside the palace, uh, ready for the formality of the uh, procession itself to Westminster. Uh, here in the studio, I'm pleased to say, two new guests have joined, two new distinguished guests. Uh, Sally Osman, who used to be Director of Communications at Buckingham Palace and uh, knows the family and the system very well. And um, another who knows uh, the Queen and who knew the Queen and who knows the family well is Sir Ken Olisa, the businessman and philanthropist. And it's good to see you both. Thank you very Hello. much. Thank you. Um, Sally, first of all, you have a very special vantage point today because you know what goes on in terms of the family's response uh, to big events. Now, this event uh, is clearly bigger than any that we've dealt with in the past, even bigger than the Queen Mother's funeral, and that was a very big event. I'm just wondering, what is your sense of how they're responding to it, given what we've seen over recent days? Um, I would say they're responding in the very immaculately professional way that you would expect of everybody who's involved in all of this, including the BBC and other broadcasters, might I say. Mm -hmm. You know, we've walked through these plans a lot over the years, but I think everybody's responding well. It's quite emotional for me sitting here because right behind us is my office, um, yes. the office where Royal Communications are communicating with the yeah. world. Yeah. So they are responding as you would expect and to the to the highest level that the Queen would have expected as well. Mm. So Ken, what is your sense today of what the Queen contributed and what she was able to do, not least in the field of 
um, charities where she was the patron of so many charities and president of others and was able to lend her authority to so many good causes. Um, that's something we should reflect today. Well, I think one of the great things about this country is the charity sector. I speak with some prejudice, being chairman of a couple of charities, but we depend so much, and we saw that through the pandemic. Charities just rose up and, and solved the problems of communities. And the Queen knew that, and she knew that by am amplifying their work, by recognising it, by sprinkling a little bit of pixie dust amongst them, they would be encouraged and, and enthused. Yeah. And, and, of course, rewarded. The Queen's Award for Voluntary Service you know, is the equivalent of a, of a national honour. So it was clearly very, very important. It wasn't, it wasn't just wallpaper and, and patronage. It was very much involved. Um, when we talk about involvement, we, we don't just mean the odd hour here or there. I mean, actually, in terms of lots of the causes, what people have been telling us over the last week is that there were repeat visits, there were offers of support, um, there were practical measures that were offered way beyond just using the name on a letterhead. Is that right? It, totally right. And I'll and I, I give you an example. We, we ran a little project in London where I'm, great, where I'm the Lord Lieutenant for small faith-based charities. And the palace heard about it and said, how did it go? And it, it had gone very well. And so the, the Queen organised an enormous reception in Buckingham Palace for faith-based charities from the whole yeah. of the country. But they're all little ones. It was a church here, a Muslim charity there, a Jewish charity here. And, they were, and we, as we stood in the, in the uh, line-up before we went in to meet all the people, Her Majesty said, just listen to them all chirruping out there. Yes. Because the joy of all these little charities coming together, being recognised, being thanked, was something, a classic example of the sort of thing that she stood for. And in terms of your work in that office over there, Sally, um, how much of your work to do with the Queen's public activity was to do with helping charitable organisations? It was absolutely essential. I mean, the, 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 monarch, the monarchy's work with charities is such an important part of their soft power, you know, in terms of uniting the nation in so many ways and reflecting, as Ken says, you know, the small charities, the big national charities that go from sovereign to sovereign but also those kind of um, charities that reflect the rest of national life, the Queen's Award for Enterprise, the Queen's um, Anniversary Awards for Higher Education. They're all absolutely critical in terms of the, um, the monarch's work and in terms of the royal family, every generation does it slightly differently as well. It stretches back generations. And it's worth saying that if you've been involved in one of these exercises as a small charity, the opportunity to meet a member of the royal family, it's life-changing. It's something you'll remember forever and you'll tell people about and it, and it reinforces the DNA of, of the nation. Let's pause for a second, if we can, um, because we have the Tri-Service Guard of Honour forming up in Wellington Barracks and here we have the band of the Corps of Royal Marines who are preparing to play and the Royal Salute is about to be played. And the colours, as we can see throughout the day, draped in black. The band of the Corps of the Royal Marines, and this is part of the Tri Service Guard of Honour that will form up in Parliament Square. Uh, the Royal Navy with the King's Colour of the Fleet. And soldiers from Nijmegen Company, 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards with the King's Colour. And the Royal Air Force with the King's Colour. So the Tri Service Guard of Honour. And they'll be marching off fairly soon uh, to take up their positions on the eastern side of Parliament Square, ready for the uh, procession when it arrives from Whitehall and makes its way to Westminster Hall. So over at the Palace of Westminster, uh, 
which is bathed in sunshine this afternoon. Very nice contrast to yesterday. There we have the Elizabeth Tower, named in memory, of course, of Her Majesty, and the great bell of Big Ben, which will be tolling every minute during the procession itself today. And Westminster Hall there, just in the shadows on the right-hand side, the oldest part of the Palace of Westminster. And my colleague, Petrock Trelawney, is there. Hugh, yes, the Elizabeth Tower renamed for Queen Elizabeth II to mark her Diamond Jubilee ten years ago. And the clock face of Big Ben, the newly restored clock face of Big Ben, its rich gilding glowing in this glorious afternoon sunshine, setting off perfectly with the blue skies above London. At the exact moment that the procession bearing Her Late Majesty's coffin sets off from Buckingham Palace, a bell here will start to toll and it will ring out every minute until the cortege arrives at the Palace of Westminster. Westminster Hall itself, nearly a thousand years old. For much of yesterday, it was filled with soldiers, choristers, heralds, parliamentary officials, and members of corps of royal bodyguards established under Tudor monarchs, all preparing in minute detail for this moment. The Queen's mother and father both lay in state here inside these walls, and soon her coffin will rest on a catafalque draped in purple cloth. This is a highly symbolic occasion, the moment that the coffin becomes the responsibility of the Earl Marshal and passes from the care of the royal household to the state. After the procession arrives here, there'll be a short service led by the Archbishop of Canterbury and sung by the choirs of the Chapel Royal and Westminster Abbey. Then the first vigil will be mounted mounted by the household cavalry, the gentlemen at arms and the yeomen of the guard. The first of 20 watches, each one lasting six hours. Watches that will run continuously until Monday morning, when the coffin will be carried across Parliament Square to Westminster Abbey for the funeral service. And this afternoon, once the royal party has left, well, the hall will close briefly and will then reopen its doors again, allowing the public the chance to file past the coffin and pay their final respects. And now the King's Troop of the Royal Horse Artillery are deploying in Hyde Park from where they will fire the minute guns. Every minute to remember, to draw the capital to attention. And here at Wellington Barracks, soldiers, sailors and airmen of the Tri-Service Guard of Honour now depart for Parliament Square. led by Lieutenant Colonel Jason Bircham, Principal Director of Music of the Royal Marines. And these soldiers, sailors and airmen will not be part of the formal funeral cortege because they are going ahead to Parliament Square and they will be ready in position to receive the cortege when it arrives.
This reminds us, of course, that beyond her relationship with the troops of the Household Division, the Queen was Commander-in-Chief of the entire armed forces. So to the rousing music being played by the uh, Royal Marine Band, we are in a position to see just the corner there of uh, Horse Guards Avenue um, and Birdcage Walk as the Tri-Service Guard of Honour makes its way to Parliament Square. They will be providing the King's Guard in Parliament Square ready for the procession when it arrives at the Palace of Westminster. And as we look at these images and as we see all the expectant faces in the crowds, uh, all along the Mall, uh, and the crowd swelling with every minute. Uh, my guests are still with me, Sir Ken Elisa and Sally Osman. Um, and as we look at this, Sally, and everyone here in the crowd, of course, acutely aware that it's been a great burden placed on the King's shoulders now, but after a very long apprenticeship, a record period as Prince of Wales, he's now King Charles III, Lots of people very impressed with the way that he's stepped up and the eloquence with which he's spoken in recent days. How does the palace, because you will know this better than anyone, how does the palace manage that transition and all the different things that the king may well want to do, the different ways in which he may want to operate? How is that being managed? Well, it's interesting, you know, that the queen on his 70th birthday made a very nice speech calling him the uh, duchy original, but he's very much his own man. Yeah. And he will be his own man. But as we've seen over the last few days, the machinery of monarchy keeps ticking and he will pick up those duties. I wouldn't call it a burden necessarily. It's a different kind of duty. He spent his, in his entire life too, serving people, uh, being dutiful, etc. And this is just a different way of doing it now in terms of now holding the, uh, the, 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 the role of monarch. Well, we're just looking at the crowds, and of course this is an interesting sight, Sally. Look at this. These are the staff of Clarence House uh, who've turned out for this procession today. And Clarence House, of course, a home which has had, again, strong links with the late Queen and with the late Duke of Edinburgh and indeed Prince Charles. Uh, and indeed the Queen Mother as well. Mm. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's very different and I'm not quite sure what the practicalities will be in terms of who stays where, but um, these people have worked with um, the, the King yes. for many years and there'll be a lot of affection there, as there will be for all the people in Buckingham Palace mm. who've worked with the Queen so closely, who'll be really feeling this very keenly. It's one thing that we've maybe not reflected enough on, to be honest, which is to do with um, the kind of impact this will have had on staff who've had, in some cases, a lifelong um, record of service to the Queen. Um, some of them surely will stay on, but some clearly will maybe feel that as the Queen has left us, it's maybe time for them too to move on. It's a difficult time. It's a difficult time and I'm sure those decisions will be being made. The people I keep thinking about are the ladies in waiting actually who've been such a constant in the Queen's life alongside her personal pages, alongside Angela Kelly who is obviously the Queen's dresser and uh, personal assistant. You know, these people who have lived with her and have seen the private side of the yes. Queen as much as the public side, you know, they will be, they will be feeling, but everybody will, mm. anybody who's been involved in the household at any time is feeling this quite personally. We talk about the public side there, Sir Ken, and of course as, as Lord Lieutenant of London, um, of all places, uh, you will have had your uh, regular contact, you will know exactly what this relationship is about. Um, 
the Lord Lieutenancy in itself is a, is a role that lots of people and you know kind of don't quite get what it involves. Mm. Um, how would you explain it? Well, the challenge with the Lord Lieutenancy is that it's a relatively modern institution in our country. It was King Henry VIII who established the role of Lord Lieutenant, so we're only 500 years in post. <laughs> <laughs> and his his brief then was to uphold the dignity of the monarchy in each county, which meant in those days quelling riots and raising the army. So it was until the early 20th century that the Lord Lieutenant would raise the county army, for example. We moved on a long way now. Quelling riots is done by the Metropolitan Police. And uh, never mind about how we recruit people to the army. It's irrelevant to today. But, but, the, but the point is our task remains the same, which is to seek ways within each county, and there are 98 of us, to uphold the dignity of the monarchy. And that means taking the, the objectives, the values of the monarchy, and amplifying them in every way that we can, supporting charities, supporting the military, supporting the population, building bridges. The, Her Majesty was so strong on looking for the good things in people and then amplifying them rather than looking for the divisions and my 98 or 97 colleagues and I are focused very much on doing that on on the ground and we talked of transition with Sally with the transition from Prince Charles to King Charles the third and the way that that relationship will change how do you foresee that well I should be getting new instructions clearly on, on what I'm required to do and I'm sure some things will change but but isn't the most wonderful reaction to what we're seeing at the moment is so little actually changes the continuity in our lives I mean seeing that seeing the heralds in their tabards the other day somebody once said it was like a, it was like a theme park no it's not it's the it's the absolute embodiment of our DNA and the values of the nation seeing people celebrating here at the concert and at, and, and at the uh, at the pageant, it was us saying, well done for being what we are and what we believe in. Seeing people working so hard in the pandemic to help each other out was an embodiment of that. So, yes, of course, there will be some changes, but I, I'm very confident the sweep of history will continue. Yeah. Do you share that confidence? Absolutely. And that word continuity is so critical mm. in terms of its seamless uh, from monarch to monarch, even though the world around is changing. Their, their values mm. and their purpose um, are are critical and that continues in terms of serving the people. And, I, and I, I, we must be the envy of the world. Just think what's happened. Head of state has changed, prime minister has changed, not a shot fired, not a window broken, not a riot on the street. We've just moved it through. I mean, how many countries in the world can claim to have managed this kind of transition as well as we have? It's good to see you both. Thank you both for coming thank in. Thank you. Sally and uh, Sir Ken, thank you very much. Well, over the past six days, as we've mentioned, um, the King has been offering his own tributes, very moving tributes to his late mother, talking of her dedication, her devotion as sovereign, uh, which never wavered, he said, through uh, times of change and progress, through times of joy and celebration, times of sadness and loss. Those were the King's words, and all the uh, tributes we've had, underlying all of them, even the most formal, um, there you have the sense of a devoted son, uh, in Charles's case, paying tribute to his mother. I do have you know, very happy memories of, of childhood. We had such incredibly jolly games. You know, here, I remember Clarence House. So we used to live here, upstairs, the top of the house in the nursery. And I, I, mean, I remember we used to have lots of laughs. So I could, sometimes make her laugh anyway, which is always very jolly. And I shall never forget her, you know, when we were small, having a bath, and she came in wearing, practicing wearing the crown for the coronation, you know, all those sort of marvelous moments. Particularly, I've never forgotten when I, you know, went to the part of the coronation, The sheer length of her reign has been a remarkable achievement, I think, in itself to you know, maintain that degree of uh, involvement and dedication and effort over so many years. I think the, the act of being there, of being a, a continuing reference point of stability and um, reassurance, 
is something that uh, I think is, is of the greatest importance. And that, I think, is what my mama has done, which is, which is truly remarkable. I mean, she was always there, and you know, I again talked to her about this, that, or the other, and um, and that that's always been something. I think that well, it'd be very difficult not to have, if you know what I mean. So, all those memories will, uh, I hope, um, keep me going. Yes, it, it um, well. I was very lucky to have her as a mother. Such warmth in the tributes there, uh, genuine warmth, which uh, came across. And of course, we've heard the public tributes to the Queen from uh, the then Prince of Wales. But of course, um, it's a different matter privately. And what you got there was a sense of the Prince's affection and love for his mother, which was a lovely thing to see. A great sight in Buckingham Palace right now, because we have the grand figure of the drum major uh, saluting and ready for the procession to get underway in a few minutes' time. And I've been joined once again in the studio by Sir David Attenborough and by Robert Hardman, the writer and author and uh, journalist um, at the Daily Mail. And good to join, good to see you. And thanks for joining us, Robert and uh, Sir you. David, once again. Um, they were very warm tributes and just the love and the affection in the new King's words when he spoke last week um, after the Queen's death were very apparent. What kind of king will he make, do you think, Sir David? Well, he, there couldn't be anybody who has thought about it more and more deeply uh, than he. Uh, from my point of view, of course, uh, from the point of view of relationship with the natural world and concern about the natural world, uh, he's been in the forefront um, and, and took quite extreme lines when they were not as popular or as widespread as they are now. I mean, uh, he was, uh, the question of talking to the plants, at the time, it was joked about. But actually now, you, yes. you, you realise that that came from his heart. He really meant it. And, and it, and it is, couldn't be more important now than it's ever been. David, we're approaching the moment when this procession is going to begin. There we have the great scene, the great formality, and the symmetry of the military there providing the Guard of Honour uh, at Buckingham Palace and the Royal Standard flying, signalling that the King is there, King Charles III, who will be part of this procession. He will be following the procession on foot with other members of the family. And uh, it'll be a solemn moment when they, of course, follow the procession all the way to Westminster Hall. Let's join Fergal Keane again. Soon now we expect the coffin to emerge from Buckingham Palace. The bearer party has carried the coffin, led by the Sovereign's Piper, through the Marble Hall and the Grand Hall. And from there, it will be taken by the, gar <coughs> by the Guard of Honour to the gun carriage. Already in the bow room, the Crown Jeweller has placed the imperial state crown on the coffin and the royal florist has placed a fresh wreath of flowers. And this wreath of flowers has included a selection of foliage including pine from the gardens of Balmoral and lavender and rosemary from the gardens at Windsor. Stillness now, before that moment 
when the crowds will see, for the first time, the coffin moving, leaving Buckingham Palace for the last time. And a time to reflect on what the Queen meant to so many. I'm thinking of the voices outside Windsor Castle last Thursday, just as the flag came to half-mast, and it dawned on people that she had died. One young man, Josh Webb, a neighbour, as he put it, of hers in Web Windsor, told me she was a guiding light, a lesson in how to behave, how to be. reversed in respect for the monarch. Passing under the Great Arch for the last time, Queen Elizabeth II. Following the coffin as it leaves Buckingham Palace, King Charles and senior members of the royal family. The king is wearing the full day ceremonial uniform with the rank of field marshal and carrying 
the Field Marshal's baton presented to him by the Queen when he became Field Marshal in 2012.
we hear the steady beating of the drum, the ringing of Big Ben, and the minute guns. These sounds echoing across the capital. day of most solemn duty for a king and a son. poignant to reflect that the Mall was most recently the backdrop for the Queen's jubilee celebrations in Dune. The end of those celebrations also marked the last time the Queen appeared on Buckingham Palace balcony when crowds flooded the Mall. Officer of the gun carriage is Captain Amy Cooper, 31 years old. She's the only mounted officer today. She's riding the horse Lord Firebrand.
now passing the statues of King George VI and Queen Mother. The bronze statue of the Queen Mother who died in 2002, aged 101, was unveiled by Her Majesty the Queen in February 2009.
cortege now moves down towards Horse Guards Parade. The place where the Queen celebrated her birthday with the trooping of the colour. The flags of the Commonwealth, that organisation which was so important in the life of Queen Elizabeth. Now departing Buckingham Palace, the Queen Consort and the Princess of Wales, Duchess of Sussex and Countess of Wessex, leaving from the Grand Entrance and they are travelling to the Palace of Westminster where they will be ready to meet the cortege. Cortege now entering Horse Guards Parade.
applause there in appreciation of the Queen's life, mingled, of course, with the grief natural to a moment like this. the archway and briefly out of the sunlight, but the constant steady beat of the drum, that metronome of grief. The gun carriage now emerges onto Whitehall for the last part of the journey towards Westminster.
passing the Cenotaph, unveiled in 1920 in the aftermath of the Great War, and where Her Majesty came year after year in November to remember the dead. Members of the royal family now saluting as they pass the cenotaph.
as the procession arrives at Parliament Square. The Tri-Service Guard of Honour is waiting with colours draped from the RAF, the Army and the Navy. And passing the statue of Sir Winston Churchill, who had a particularly close bond with the Queen. He was her first Prime Minister. When he retired in 1959, she wrote to him, I will forever be able to hold the place of my first Prime Minister, to whom both my husband and I so much. I shall always be so profoundly grateful. The gun carriage has now arrived at the Palace of Westminster, where the Queen will lie in state until her funeral next Monday. The guards removing the bearskin hats in preparation for the carrying of the coffin.
there a party. Eight soldiers from Queen's Company of the 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards. Eight young men charged with this most public of duties. And from within Westminster Hall comes the sound of the choirs of the Chapel Royal and Westminster Abbey, singing a setting of Psalm 139. O Lord, thou hast searched me out and known me, thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Words sung 20 years ago as the coffin of Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, was carried into this hall. O oh God, the maker and redeemer of all mankind, grant us, with thy servant Queen Elizabeth and all the faithful departed, the sure benefits of thy son's saving passion and glorious resurrection, that in the last day, when all things are gathered up in Christ, we may with them enjoy the fullness of thy promises. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. O merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, in whom whosoever believeth shall live, though he die, and whosoever liveth and believeth in him shall not die eternally, who also hath taught us by his holy apostle St. Paul not to be sorry as men without hope for them that sleep in him, we meekly beseech thee, O Father, to raise us from the death of sin unto the life of righteousness, that when we shall depart this life, we may rest in him, as our hope is that our sister doth, and that at the general resurrection in the last day, we may be found acceptable in thy sight and receive that blessing which thy well-beloved Son shall then pronounce to all who love and fear thee, saying, Come, ye blessed children of my Father, receive the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world. Grant this, we beseech thee, O merciful Father, through Jesus Christ, our Mediator and Redeemer. Amen. As our Saviour Christ hath commanded and taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
O God, the protector of all who trust in thee, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us thy mercy, that thou, being our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we finally lose not things eternal. Grant this, O Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. And to God's gracious mercy and protection, we commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. The service led by the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Most Reverend Justin Welby, and the Dean of Westminster, Dr. David Hoyle. The choir of the Chapel Royal and the choir of Westminster Abbey, conducted by James O'Donnell, and it was his setting of the psalm that we heard as the Queen's coffin was carried in. Psalm 139, a setting inspired by the Orthodox Contachion for the Dead. The cross of Westminster is placed at the head of the coffin. cross, a gift to the Abbey a century ago. It bears a Latin inscription, Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Colour Royal Standard of Queen's Company, 1st Battalion, Grenadier Guards. The standard presented to the Guards by the Sovereign on commencement of their reign, not changed or replaced since then, only paraded in the Sovereign's presence. For the last time, it's lowered a solemn salute to the Queen from her company and from her Grenadiers. Six feet of heavily embroidered and tasseled silk, everything to manoeuvre gently into position. The guardsmen who serve in the Queen's company, known fondly as members of the Monarch's Mob. Several of the guardsmen returned on Friday from service in Iraq, called back to do their duty.
so we prepare for the first vigil. The first six-hour watch. 20 watches in total between now and the moment on Monday morning when Her Late Majesty's coffin is carried to Westminster Abbey for the funeral. The gentleman at arms, a bodyguard established by Henry VIII in 1509, wearing the uniform of a heavy Dragoon Guards officer of the 1840s. Their helmets with white swan feather plumes. and four officers from the household cavalry. The lifeguards, white plumes on their helmets, the blues and royals with red plumes. take their positions on the corner of the catafalque and a double tap from the stick of the officer of the watch commanding the procedure of the watch the start the finish and the rotation of the guard Rod. The Lord Speaker and the Speaker of the House of Commons lead the procession out of Westminster Hall, passing by the coffin. Marshal, the 18th Duke of Norfolk. He leads the King and the Royal Party. To the left of the Earl Marshal. Lord Carrington, the Lord Great Chamberlain. Prince of Wales in his RAF uniform. Cross there held by the chaplain to the Archbishop of Canterbury, Tosano Le Depot.
king and queen consort depart the palace of Westminster to return to Clarence House. They pass through the carriage gates out of New Palace Yard and into Parliament Square. you that after this moment in Westminster Hall the building will be closed for approximately an hour and then the first members of the public many of whom have been queuing already for several nights will be allowed in to file past the coffin inside the heralds King of Arms, Heralds and Percivants. Percivants and Heralds of Scotland and England. Nora and Ulster, King of Arms. We heard reading the proclamation at Hillsborough Castle the weekend. of the House of Commons and House of Lords, parliamentary staff and members of the Royal Household gathered here to witness this event. uniform forces come forward to pay their respects to their chief. The Westminster Cross, the Imperial State Crown resting on a cushion of flowers, including flowers from Balmoral and Windsor, and the royal standard that rests on top of the coffin with its four quarterings, two for England, the three lions passant, one for Scotland, a lion rampant, and one for Ireland, a harp.
Father's Day crown made for the coronation of George VI in 1937 with over 3,000 gems worn by the monarch at the conclusion of the coronation service and here at Westminster at the state opening of Parliament. They're looking on behind the coffin, the young guardsman who carried Her Majesty the Queen into Westminster Hall today, the royal bearer party, carefully chosen from the eight tallest men in Queen's company, 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards. the sun pours through the windows of Westminster Hall. And this great act of ceremony, of pageant, military precision, but which is at the same time deeply moving for all involved. Many people I'm sure you will have spotted too, wiping a tear from their eye this afternoon. cross made from ivory and silver gilt adorned with panels of beaten gold and sapphire and the grenadier guardsmen their duty to the queen done night and day for the next four full days until Monday morning these members of our bodyguards and army officers will stand paying vigil to the sovereign as in silence people who have traveled from near and far file past them of military service are often thought to have a stiff upper lip but this afternoon it feels as 
Though some of the toughest soldiers have been touched by the poignancy of the ceremony that we've witnessed here in Westminster Hall. around as rich colors, army scarlet, polished silver and brass, high plumed helmets, the rich dark oak above, the jewels in the imperial state crown, the purple cloth of the catafalque. They bring a vivid brightness to an afternoon that is in many ways a moment of gray sadness. whose romantic names sum up their rich history. Falkland, Lilithgow, Unicorn, Ormond, Rouge, Dragon, Maltravers, Windsor, Chester, York, Richmond. The Prime Minister, and the leader of the opposition, Liz Truss and Sir Keir Starmer. Mark Drakeford, leader of the Welsh Assembly, and Nicola Sturgeon, First Minister of Scotland. The title that Mark Drakeford holds in Wales. relationship between Parliament and King, between monarchy and state, brought vividly to life in the first event here in Westminster Hall on Monday morning. And we heard addresses from both speakers, House of Commons and the House of Lords, passing condolence, but also reminding the King, the new King, of his responsibilities to ensure the freedom and happiness of his subjects. Another tap of the stick. whether in the middle of the night or in the midday sun. These bodyguards and officers prepare to do their duty. Honoring the late queen as this vigil continues here at Westminster Hall.
the Grenadier Guards not required to give the loyal toast because their loyalty to the Crown has never been questioned. The Heralds. Three of whom read those proclamations. I mentioned Noran Ulster, King of Arms, read the proclamation at Hillsborough Castle. Lord Lyon, the sole King of Arms in Scotland, who read the proclamation at the Mercat Cross in Edinburgh. And Clancy, King of Arms, who read the proclamation at the Royal Exchange in the City of London after the principal proclamation on Saturday. Choristers from the Chapel Royal and the Choir of Westminster Abbey. The Chapel Royal Choristers in red and gold. And the men of the Chapel Royal wearing those distinctive white bow ties. The choristers now return to the choir school at Westminster Abbey where they will prepare for their role in Monday's funeral. The anthem they sang, by the way, by Edward Bairstow, Jesus, you the very thought of thee, Bairstow, a great Yorkshireman, born in Huddersfield, organist of York Minster for more than three decades until his death in 1946. Hall 900 years old, more than 900 years. The largest hall in England, probably the largest hall in Europe when it was built under the instructions of William II, the son of William the Conqueror, in 1097. And ever since then, part of our national story. A place where feasts and banquets, court masks, and jousting tournaments took place. A market hall for 500 years from the 13th century. The diarist parliamentarian Samuel Pepys used to purchase books, gloves, and caps from one of its stalls. William Gladstone, the first person to lie in state here in 1898. 1965, Winston Churchill rested here. Edward VII in 1910, George V in 1936, George VI in 1952. Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, rested here for three days before her funeral in April 2002. Black Rod, Sarah Clark. Leading the slow parade past the coffin. and leader of the opposition emerged into the sunlight. Walking through the thick sand carefully laid outside this building to enable the gun carriage to come to a perfect halt. 
where it retired anyone who stepped upon it before the arrival of Her Late Majesty, a team of men with rakes to ensure it was perfectly presented. As the parliamentarians leave, they pass the fountain that was placed here in honour of Her Late Majesty's Silver Jubilee in 1977. There will be VIPs filing through here over the next few days, foreign heads of state, for example, coming to the funeral. But essentially now this is a, a place for the people to come and pay tribute to their late monarch. Westminster Hall will now close for an hour or so and when it opens again it will be as I say a public space in the middle of the night in the middle of the day on a warm or wet afternoon in the soft chill of a September night people will queue patiently perhaps for hour after hour after hour waiting for their chance to file past the coffin of Her Late Majesty and say their own private farewell. From the solemnity of Westminster Hall to the sunshine outside and that is Lambeth Bridge uh, crossing the Thames uh, just near Lambeth Palace home of the Archbishop of Canterbury across to the uh, other side in the city of Westminster and the Houses of Parliament on the banks of the Thames and if you take a very close look you'll have seen the queue of people that is forming on the bridge itself and then along the south bank so this is the corner of uh, Lambeth Bridge and uh, Millbank which is on the approach to the Houses of Parliament so they have a short distance um, they don't have too long to queue but for those people who are stretching back over Lambeth Bridge and round on the Albert Embankment and on the South Bank well they'll have quite a few hours ahead of them but they're all sharing one aim which is to queue patiently and in good order and in the right spirit because they want to go and pay tribute and to pay their last respects to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II whose body now lies in state in Westminster Hall and will do for the next four days and nights until 6.30 a.m. on the day of the state funeral, which is Monday. This is the nation's opportunity to come and say thank you and farewell. There will be people whose lives, of course, have been marked by one monarch alone, many people, and they don't even remember a time before then many millions of people for whom Queen Elizabeth II has been the one constant in public life and therefore the change for many is a change that is fundamental in the way that they see the United Kingdom and in the way that they see the shape of British society. Others will be reflecting on the change of monarchy uh, to Charles III and wondering what that will bring. And Sir David Attenborough is still with me, with Robert Hardman. And Sir David, if I may say so, I think you were born within a few weeks of Her Majesty. Two and a half weeks. Two and a half weeks. After her birth. Yes. Well, that's a lovely thing to reflect today, I have to say. When you see these queues and you see people, lots of them applauding, as you rightly said earlier, um, because they want to express themselves, um, it's, it's that magic mix of remembrance and an element of course of grief plus thanks and celebration for a long reign and maybe we've now entered the the phase in this process where it's the thanks and the celebration that's possibly taking over in the next few days that has to be so 
uh, at the moment, uh, it's a moment of sadness and thanksgiving um, and solemnity. Certainly solemnity. And even those queuing are showing a good degree of solemnity because they know what's ahead of them. But Robert, it is moving, isn't it, when you see a crowd building up and it'll be growing over the hours and days ahead. It will, Hugh. It'll, it'll continue eastwards along the south bank of the Thames. Um, I mean, it's already, I would thought, a few miles long. When the late Queen Mother was lying in state, it, it ran all the way down to the edge of the city of London, and, and so it will continue. But, I mean, what we've seen um, this afternoon in, in the most immaculate, the most moving way has been effectively a, a, the, the royal family, led by the king, handing over the late queen to us. She's now there for us to pay our respects, as you said, in, in, until Monday morning. Um, and then it's her funeral and we all collectively hand her on to the almighty. But I, I, I think to have seen what we saw this afternoon, I think there's just one word for it, it's majesty. Mm. Pure majesty, the, 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 the light glinting on the imperial state crown. Mm. The, the synchronicity, the timing, everything about it, almost cinematic and yet perfect and real. From the first beat of that muffled drum when they left Buckingham Palace, time seemed to stand still for that procession. And for you, Sir David, who've been witnessing elements of public life for decades and indeed your life has run in parallel with Her Majesty's, um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts were when you saw the elegance and dignity of that procession as it made its way to Westminster. I suppose that uh, there, is, there are things that words won't do, won't carry, but actions don't carry and, and actions symbolise. And uh, it symbolised dignity, profundity, responsibility, and that life actually has a serious side, um, which was profoundly expressed by tens of thousands of people, shared by them all, and to that extent made more impact on the rest of us. It was um, a very moving afternoon. Thank you. So there you see the site of uh, Lambeth Bridge and uh, the familiar red buses uh, dotting the route. Lots of the traffic, of course, has been stopped. Um, and uh, all arrangements focused now in central London for the coming days. Um, this will be a feature of all of the images that we see in the days ahead. Um, and it will be a proper focus on all of those who've made the journey from all parts of the United Kingdom and indeed many of them will come from overseas and parts of the Commonwealth because they'll want to show that with their presence um, they have a deep respect and admiration for the Queen and all that she has achieved in what has been a record-breaking reign, the longest in British history. Now the wait obviously will be substantial for some and Westminster Hall is being prepared to be open to the public very shortly. Let's explain a little more about that. Westminster Hall, built more than 900 years ago, the oldest part of the Palace of Westminster, where for the last 100 years, British monarchs are brought to lie in state. Here, the Queen's father, King George VI, lying in state in 1952. Fifty years later, his wife Elizabeth the Queen Mother accorded the same honour. Four of the Queen Mother's grandchildren holding post around her coffin in silent tribute. just as the sons of King George V held post for their father on a cold January night in 1936. 
The custom of lying in state in Westminster Hall for members of the royal family goes back to 1910 and the death of King Edward VII. Only two non-royals have lain in state here. Prime Minister William Gladstone and the Queen's first Prime Minister, Sir Winston Churchill. And so it is that at the end of the longest reign in British history, the people shall come again to pay their last respects and say farewell to their queen. Aren't they beautiful, all of the uh, archive images that we have, reminding us, of course, that uh, we are just the latest generation uh, experiencing what previous generations have experienced. The solemn moment in Westminster Hall today um, when the bearer party brought in the coffin and then the total silence, the tranquility of the hall. Um, even on television, you could sense it. Uh, it was very real and you could see that the impact on those present, parliamentarians, uh, royal household staff, members of the royal family, uh, religious leaders, um, they were all gathered there, all of them deeply touched by what they saw and aware, of course, that this is a moment of great significance in the British story after the longest reign in our history. Um, Katie Nichol is with me, uh, who is a friend of ours, of course, on lots of these programmes from Vanity Fair. Good to see you, Katie. And we're very pleased to be joined by Lieutenant General David Leakey, who uh, for quite a few years held the post of Black Rod, which of course is one of the key posts in Parliament. And thank you so much for joining us as well, David. Um, I'm bound to maybe start with you and ask after we saw the immaculate arrangements there in Westminster Hall, um, to give us a sense of the work that's gone into that, the way that that's been um, laid out over the years, the plans adjusted from time to time, um, but really just a sense of what you and others have put into it. I think the first thing to say about it is it's a team game. Yes. Um, uh, Black Rod uh, organises the, the mechanics and the ceremonial and the event um, and is the holder, if you like, indeed the author of the op marquee plan, as, as, the, as it's called. And that plan is in a permanent stay, yeah. state of flux and change. And over the seven years that I was Black Rod, I, I have no idea how many times we rewrote the plan. And it, it, it has to be rewritten all the time because um, Westminster Hall has been the subject of refurbishment and repairs. There have been scaffolding and gantry, gantries in the roof. And every time a contract is let, for example, to uh, the builders who come in to do some work, mm. there is always a stipulation that they have to get their scaffolding down, make good yeah. and get out yeah. within six hours. Wow. And, uh, and that, so that is the sort of level yes. of detail that's been gone into. We've rehearsed it a lot. Mm. Every year there is a, a rehearsal of one mm. sort or another, including a complete build of the, of the set, yes. if you like, yes. in, in Westminster Hall. So a lot of detailed work by a lot of people. As we see the images here, of course, with the sunlight streaming in, it's very atmospheric, isn't it really? Um, the catafalque there and the rich colours, the purple, the gold and the... Uh, the crimson. And Katie, as we, we, we saw this earlier, who would not be touched and impressed by the sight that we saw? Thank you. It's impossible not to be. And that sense of history being made in this hall of history, it, it's impossible not to be touched. It's, it was a deeply, deeply moving spectacle, I think, for, for everyone that was watching it. And I think the reason that those queues are going to snake past the river, probably down to the City of London, as they did for the late Queen Mother, is because people want to be a part of this history. The Queen, I think, expected people to be a part of this. Um, yes, the plans changed over time, and we know contingency plans have been put into place because of where the Queen died. But this is absolutely what she would have wanted. She signed off on. In her life, she said, I have to be seen, to be believed. And that's as true in her death as it was in her life. That's precisely right, isn't it? It's the, it's the display. It's the display of royal authority and 
power and majesty. As uh, Robert Hardman was talking about earlier, we have the yeomen of the guard, we have the uh, troopers of the lifeguards and the blues and royals, uh, we have the gentlemen at arms, all of these figures, uh, David, that you of course are familiar with and who feature of course in events such as the state opening of parliament. So you are no strangers to the immaculate display and the, the crisp drill and everything moving to perfection in a way that if I may say so, it's difficult to find anywhere else in the world. No, but the, mm, mm, I mean, it is, you're right, and hats off to these guys because they are absolutely consummate professionals at it. Um, but the symbolism of all this, which yes. you just touched on, is also important. Um, these ancient ceremonial rituals, the, the, the uniforms, the way it's done, not just that, but the venue is a thousand years old. and. Uh, and it's quite important to understand why, why Westminster Hall is used and indeed who owns it, um, something which a lot of people don't know. Um, of course, the Palace of Westminster used to be the sovereign's residence in London until 1530, I think 1532, when there was a fire that burnt the king's apartments and Henry VIII had to move out. No sovereign has ever lived in the Palace of Westminster since then. However, and it remained a royal palace under royal ownership, to use a, a sort of a, a cheap term, if I may, um, until 1965. And then it was the Queen herself in 1965 who suggested to the then Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, that it was inappropriate for the sovereign to own and control the building in which the democratically elected chamber and her revising chamber, the House of Lords, sat. And so she suggested, and the Prime Minister agreed, that she should transfer control and management and ownership of those parts of the Palace of Westminster to, respectively, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And that happened. But she retained some of that. And she retained the robing room and the Royal Gallery, which were very precious to her, the robing room where the sovereign robes before the state opening of Parliament, and critically Westminster Hall, and incidentally the chapel that's just off Westminster mm. Hall. And why did she retain uh, for the sovereign Westminster Hall and these other rooms? It's because there are three constituent parts to our legislature. Um, the House of Commons, the elected which signs off all legislation, the House of Lords, which is the revising chamber for legislation, and the Sovereign, who signs off legislation, mm. enacts legislation, and all those three have a stake in the Palace of Westminster. They all own a bit. And one of the reasons why the Sovereign retained uh, Westminster Hall is what we're seeing here now today. Indeed. This is, this is a ceremony that is owned by the state, not yes. Parliament. Um, it's controlled by the Crown, not the government. They are closing the doors to the hall and they are preparing, of course, to prepare the hall for the um, public to be visiting a little later. Outside, we can see this glorious view of the, the Mall, stretching all the way up to the Admiralty Arch. There you have the London skyline in the background, a lovely blue sky with the London Eye there on the right um, and of course the buildings of the uh, City of London as well in the background. Um, so while we look at this scene and while we consider uh, what the queue of people is going to be doing on the south bank of the Thames, let's not forget that there are many thousands of people crowded onto the Mall and around the Palace too. So let's join Sophie who's with them. Well, we have watched the royal family return to Buckingham Palace and then leave again. The royal standard has been lowered. The union flag has been raised. The king has left Buckingham Palace. But the people are still here. The mall is absolutely packed with thousands of people. And more and more are still being allowed to come back up here around the palace, young and old. And I'm joined by Maddie Ray Reynolds, who's from Girl Guiding, 24 years old, uh, who really wanted to be here today. And, Millions of people will have seen the Queen's coffin leave the palace. Describe what it was like, though, actually being here amongst the crowd. Yeah, I mean, it was so emotional, um, not only seeing the Queen's coffin, but the members of the royal family following. Um, and it was so quiet. Everyone was so respectful. Um, and then after they kind of went past us, there was a really nice ripple of applause from everybody. So respectful and sad, but also quite nice in a way um, to show, get everyone to show their respects to her. Um, it was a really 
powerful moment um, for sure, definitely. How much do you want to go and cross the river now and join that queue? I would, I would love to. If I lived in London, I'd be straight there. Um, I have got a friend that's taken the day off work tomorrow, so she can go down this evening and queue for as long as it takes. Um, and I would, I'd be doing the same if it, if it was possible for me. Yeah. And it's so important for you to be here today because the Queen was patron of girl guiding. She was patron for her whole reign, wasn't she? 70 years. Um, she was a girl guide herself at Buckingham Palace. Yeah, she was. She was a member of the first Buckingham Palace uh, Girl Guides um, and Princess Margaret was a brownie as well. Um, and yeah, she was our patron for 70 years. Um, so it is a huge loss for us um, as an organisation. And she was such a role model to so many girls and young women, such a strong, powerful woman, um, doing so much good and being so respectful and committed to her duty, which obviously in guiding we all promise to be committed and we promise to serve our Queen. So now she's not here it's, it's, it's sad um, but we're so grateful for all of her time that she gave us um, and she'll be really really missed by us all and this for you is very much something you're doing for your family as well for your granny who was almost the same age as the queen yes yeah she's a queen's guide uh, and i'm currently working towards my queen's guide award uh, which is the highest award in guiding um, so yeah it's really special for me and for them as well yeah. maddie ray reynolds thank you very much thank you so nice to have these stories, family connections and memories. It's a day when people do tend to think about parents and grandparents and even great grandparents and think about the milestones in their own lives. Um, Katie and David are still with me. When we saw the procession, um, which made its way led by the King, of course, who was following the coffin and then the family members. When you looked at the mix of family members, what would, what would be your perceptions? Um. Well, I mean, you just mentioned family, and it, it's, it, it's clear that family was so important to Her Majesty the Queen. I mean, she's brought the people together in her death, but she's also brought her family together. And you and I were last commentating on a procession at the late Duke of Edinburgh's yeah. funeral, and of course a lot of focus on the Royal Brothers, on yes. the Duke of Cambridge, and the Prince of Wales, and the Duke of Sussex. And I thought it was wonderful that they were there, shoulder by shoulder, um, alongside Lady Phillips and um, you know, the Queen's immediate members of her family and, and important members of her household. I mean, you would have spotted her page, Paul Wybrew, who was there, who's there with her right up until the end. The master of her house are the people who have been a very important part of the bubble that has been her life for the last couple of years. And this is also, of course, their way of paying tribute and giving thanks in the way that we will see the nation do in the coming days. And talking of the coming days, David, when we see members of the public now having their opportunity to file through Westminster Hall, um, what is the arrangement for that? Are they, do they just walk through without stopping? And I mean, how long can they take? What, what is the plan? There's, a, there's a, a term called the dwell time. And this is part of the key calculation of how many people will be able to pass through the hall. And uh, we will see what happens. And it's going to be done with dignity and sobriety and solemnity and people won't be allowed to take photographs and selfies because that would detract from the dignity of the occasion. People will flow through down those two walkways that you'll have seen either side of the catafalque. Every now and again, about every 20 minutes, yeah. there will be a pause in the queue and people will get frustrated outside but the people inside who are at the top of the steps when the queue is paused will witness the changing of the vigil and that's something that they will see and uh, that itself will be a spectacle for those who are lucky enough to be at one of those paused moments. But the queue will be a long one. Um, I shall be joining it shortly. Um, I shall be trying to find the back of the queue and uh, I'm going to queue and pay my respects uh, well, as a member of Joe Public. <laughs> well, no, I was just going to tease you a little by saying there'll be people watching thinking you're a former black rod, you'll be, you know, you'll be first in the queue, but are you saying that you're going to have to join the queue? I, I dropped a hint that I might be first in the queue and I was told in two short words. Yes, yes. <laughs> you can imagine what they were. Not, not, I shall be at the back of the queue, not uh, along with Joe Public. Well, um, certainly uh, there'll be lots of us joining the queue, um, but it's, uh, it, it's really a, a logistical challenge, obviously, to manage that number of people. There were hundreds of thousands who passed through Westminster Hall uh, when the Queen Mother was lying in state. Um, I'm assuming that the plan is based on a much bigger number than that this time. Yes, it is. There are some choke points which you cannot avoid. One is the door into Westminster Hall and the other is the door and the exit out. And uh, we experimented you know, with, with live humans 
um, how best we could manage that and what flow we could achieve without pressing people through and making yes. it an undignified scrum. So that work has been done and uh, there will be uh, doorkeepers and, uh, and ushers on the floor of the hall mm. to um, encourage people to move along quietly so that people don't stop and pay their respects because the more people who stop and pay their respects in that way means fewer people will be able to go through the hall and I hope people will understand that keeping that flow through means that more of the public um, and me at the back of the yes. queue can get there. <laughs> it's, it's interesting Katie because I, I read um, that the queue for um, the lying in state for George VI back in 1952 was uh, four miles long mm. um, and you know that that's been kind of mentioned this time as well mm. um, and uh, the thing then was uh, if you look at the lovely archive material um, people were in their tears coming out of there they were you know, people were mopping their eyes and coming out and looking I mean clearly and that king had died at a very early age yes. so that was an added dimension in that sense mm. um, do you think this thing has a momentum of its own? More, the more people see that there's a queue there, and the more people see that people have an opportunity to go in, they want to be the more will go. turn up. Uh, I absolutely think that, Hugh. And I, you know, from speaking to people here, they, they were here when the new king arrived. They want to be here. They want to pay their respects. And they want to witness this moment in history. And I don't think they will put off the queues. I mean, let's be honest, we're British. We're very good at queuing, whatever the weather and however inclement it may be. So I, I don't think that will put people off one bit. And um, of course, there will be another opportunity um, on the day of the state funeral yes. with the president session but I think you know for so many people that I've spoken to to be there to witness that moment in that great hall it is just something unique yes. and something that they want to yes. experience for themselves. David and Katie can we pause there for a moment and thank you both very much it's good to see you both thank you. Um, well we were mentioning earlier that people were sharing lots of experiences those on the mall there doesn't it look magnificent really does um, union flags there decked all along the Mall. Looks like birthday parade day, which is always a very happy day. Well, today is a very um, powerful mix of emotions, as we've already reflected. And Sophie is with a special guest who can tell us a little about his thoughts today. I am indeed Alan Gill, resplendent in his Chelsea pensioners scarlet. Uh, how much did it mean to you to be here this afternoon? Well, it's a great privilege. It's a great honour. And... Uh, really you know to see the, the queen go for by for, you know the very last time before uh, her funeral um, was very moving what did the queen mean to the chelsea pensioners well as you probably know uh, chelsea pensioners are all veterans of the army uh, we've all taken an oath of allegiance to the queen and uh, no matter how many years you do, I think, you know, that stays with you all of your life. So um, apart from the fact that she was a, an outstanding monarch, um, she really means everything to uh, each and every one of us at uh, Chelsea. And she's very familiar to the Chelsea pensioners because for her entire reign, she, she went to your back garden every year, didn't she, for the Chelsea, Chelsea Flower Show. And you were very lucky. I saw her too this year, yeah, looking absolutely. resplendent. Absolutely, yeah, um, and it coincided actually with me, uh, my very first day at the uh, Royal Hospital Chelsea. So, uh, you know, another privilege uh, to see the Queen uh, going to uh, one of her favourite flower shows, yeah. And it was one yeah. of her last big public appearances and she was in wonderful spirits, wasn't she? She just smiled and smiled and smiled. She did, yeah, absolutely radiant, yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. Now, you are not going to join the queue to file past the coffin because you have just found out a few days ago that you're actually going to the funeral. Yes, eight of us are lucky enough, privileged enough, and again, you know, with, with the honour uh, of, of going to Her Majesty's funeral, yeah. How were you selected? Um, well, several people were put into a hat. Uh, we have four companies at the Royal Hospital and there were two people selected from each company uh, and I was just lucky enough to uh, to come out. And your reaction when your name was pulled out of the hat? Um, well actually um, I was very upset, upset, emotional. I had to just walk away and uh, 
yeah. <laughs> Tears were rolling down my face, actually, yeah. yeah. I'm not surprised. Thank you very much for talking to us this afternoon. Thank you very much, Sophie. It's a pleasure. Uh, Sophie, many thanks, and uh, of course to your guest for sharing those thoughts with us today, which will resonate, I'm sure, with my next guest, who is Brigadier Greville Bibby uh, of Coldstream Guards, now retired. Greville, it's good to see you. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, it's been a day of great solemnity, even in the sunshine, um, but it's been a day, too, of people applauding, uh, applauding the Queen's contribution and uh, what she's achieved over such a long life. You came across Her Majesty many times during your career, and I'm just wondering what you'd like to share with viewers in terms of your memories or perceptions. I think the overriding memory is the Queen was a very human, human being. One tends to put the Queen on a pedestal, and quite rightly so, but when you then suddenly find yourself in her presence, it's quite overwhelming. Um, and I did, as you say, as a soldier, I had the privilege of meeting her on a number of occasions. I was lucky enough to command the Queen's Company, which is the, the uh, you saw the soldiers who were bearing the coffin, they were from the Queen's Company. Um, but my, I think my fondest memory is when, when Her Majesty had all the officers who had carried the colour from the Grenadier Guards on Trooping the Colour for lunch in Buckingham Palace in 2019. So only about 19, 20 of us having lunch with the, with the Queen, which was, which was surreal, really. Um, and I wasn't sat next to her, um, and I thought, oh, that's a shame, I'm not going to speak to the Queen. We ended up going from lunch um, into, uh, into a little drawing room afterwards for coffee, and I suddenly found myself stood next to the Queen, and 20 minutes later, I still stood next to the Queen. Um, and we had a most delightful conversation, and uh, she just hosted the President, President Trump, um, which was fascinating, and uh, I, I must admit, once I started to relax, I got a bit cheeky, and I asked if she had a mobile phone um, and uh, she wasn't a great fan of, of mobile telephones, I can tell you that much. Well, that's interesting. I mean, isn't it lovely that you can feel relaxed enough to be able to ask a question like that? That actually says quite a lot. Well, it says a huge amount about her, which is why I say a very human yeah. human being. Yeah. And very quickly, you're, you're, you, know, you wouldn't dare suggest you're looking at your granny or your mother, but, but that's how she made yeah. it. Yeah. How made you feel? I mean, she was very concerned that I didn't have a cup of coffee. <laughs> and I just, there was no way I was going to hold a cup of coffee and try and drink it in front of the Queen. Um, I know there'll be some viewers now who think that we've mixed up our regiments, and uh, because I introduced you as a Coldstream Guardsman, and of course, then you've gone on to speak about the Grenadier Guards. Um, I should point out that, of course, you're one of those lucky fellows who's served with both, um, and that's the reason, um, because I want that clear before we go on. Uh, you've had a distinguished career with, with both. And I'm just wondering, given that well, troops of the Household Division have such a close bond with Her Majesty, and now indeed with the King, um, how does that manifest itself? When we talk about this close bond, or the intimate bond between them, her, we call them Her Majesty's personal troops, for example, how, how does that manifest itself in the course of a year when you know, you are mounting guard or you're taking part in parades or whatever you're doing, really, or, or of course, on operations. Um, how does it show? I think it's very easy, really. Um, when, uh, when a soldier joins the Army or, or, or uh, you know, Navy, Air Force, anybody in the military, um, the first thing we do is we swear an oath of allegiance to the monarch. Um, so it's pretty, you know, clear from the outset who, who the boss is. Um, uh, and then, of course, you drill down into the history and you look at uh, the household division, um, household, royal household division. Mm -hmm. Of course, going back to 1650, when King Charles II was in exile, mm -hmm. who did he have with him? He had some troops um, who turned out to be the first regiment of foot guards, yeah. um, the grenadier guards. He had the lifeguards with him. Mm -hmm. And the thing that is unique about the household division is that the monarch of the day has always designated those regiments um, as part of their household division. So, of course, one, one, one wears that with huge pride. Um, and when you change the guard at Buckingham Palace, you're conscious that Her Majesty and the royal family are literally just through the wall. When you troop the colour, you're trooping the colour for Her Majesty. Uh, and so it goes on. It, it's a constant reminder that that, that, that link with the royal family is, is so important and so special. 
Well, you were speaking those words uh, eloquently, Greville, as we saw the images there of Buckingham Palace and the Union flag. And of course, people are still milling around uh, St. James's Park and uh, Green Park. Um, another point I wanted to put to you was this. Um, we're looking now at a new chapter. Mm. We have King Charles III. Um, people have been impressed already with the way in which he's spoken about his mother, the way he addressed the nation on television last week. Give, given your links again and given your knowledge, what kind of king will he make, do you think? Um, well, I would say this, wouldn't I, Hugh? Mm. He'll make an excellent king. Um, why, but, then? But, but, but I why? absolutely mean it. Mm. And, and the reason I can, can, can say that, quite apart from my sister having once been one of his secretaries, yes. um, we got to know him very well, uh, and he was a delightful boss, by all accounts. Um, I've, I've worked with him when I was uh, commanding a, a brigade in the, in the northeast of England. Um, Prince Charles, as he was then, came up to Teesside and he got us all in the room. He got the military, he got the police, he got business leaders, he got the local authorities in the room to talk about what we could all do together to help those less privileged people, particularly in this case, Teesside. But of course he was doing that all over the country and he's done that all over the country. Um, through his own charities and he's been doing that ever since he could start doing that I'm guessing from about the age of 10 um, so it's it, I think it's going to be a very very natural transition from everything he's been doing as, as the Prince of Wales he will continue to do as King Charles Greville as ever a great pleasure to talk to you thank you very much Brigadier Greville Burby our thanks to him well we were talking there about duty and sense of duty and we were talking about the Queen um, and Charles, mother and son, of course. Well, the Queen's sense of duty, without doubt, came from watching her father at work. Uh, and the values that informed his reign of 16 years, uh, it was Princess Elizabeth who learned valuable lessons during the war, when they stayed, of course, uh, in central London, before moving out to Windsor Castle at the age of 13, when the, the bombs were falling and Buckingham Palace was damaged. And then, of course, Princess Elizabeth joined the ATS at the age of 18. And as uh, Greville was saying there, her support for veterans and members of the armed forces, um, well, that support has been a prominent feature of her reign. Princess Elizabeth celebrates her 16th birthday by inspecting, as their new colonel, the Grenadier Guards at a special parade at Windsor Castle. And so it began, a relationship with the Guards that was strengthened when Elizabeth became Queen. On the death of the King, my father, it falls to me, a sovereign, to assume the colonelcy in chief of all five regiments comprising the Brigade of Guards. Oh, For 70 years, there was a deep bond between the soldiers and their sovereign. Each year, they marked her official birthday by trooping their colours. Her Majesty the Queen, on Burmese, a small figure on this huge parade ground. Throughout her reign, the guards stood vigilant outside Buckingham Palace. In death, as in life, they remain on duty for their beloved Queen. So there we have the lovely site of Wellington Barracks, which is just across the road from Buckingham Palace. And uh, my colleague JJ Chalmers is there. Well, what a day, what a triumphant display. A, a real show of respect to Her Majesty the Queen. It was absolutely impeccable. I can say as a veteran how unbelievably proud I am of every Armed Forces personnel that was on uh, parade today, including this one, uh, Guardsman Asbury. Uh, well, what a day for you. You're 18 years old, you've served as a guard uh, for less than a year now, and you have been part of one of the most important days in our military's history. Uh, can you put into words uh, how it felt to be out there. Surreal. It didn't feel real until you actually saw the coffin coming by. Really? Yeah. What were you thinking then at the point when you saw the, the, the gun carriage coming on and you saw Her Majesty the Queen? in? We're making her proud really? that we're doing our job for her. Oh. I, I mean, as, as a, a member of the British Army, as a, as, as a guard, what does Her Majesty the Queen mean to you? It's like, she's our boss. We're making her proud every day. 
every day when you go to work. By the way, I should point out these buses leaving here are because many of these troops are just about to head off to essentially get a little bit of rest and do this again as a rehearsal tonight. Yeah. I mean, you've got to essentially go back to work in, in a few hours' time uh, after you've done your admin, you had a little bit of a sleep. Uh, it, it takes a lot of resilience and a lot of will and strength out in a parade like that, especially in the heat like we have today. Yes. What, what's in your mind throughout that time? I'm making my family proud, like what my family would be thinking. Really? What day. do you think your family would be thinking? I mean, what did they say to you when they heard that you would be, you'd be on parade? They're proud of me. It's like a one-in-a-lifetime opportunity. We won't ever do it again. Wow. Well, I can say it won't just be your family that's proud. I'll be the first to say that the nation is proud of you as well. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Well, these uh, lovely scenes in the late afternoon, it's uh, 4.30, not quite late afternoon, but uh, certainly getting on because the sun is uh, starting to go down. It's that time of year, but the light is beautiful uh, on the water there in St. James's Park. Um, and there you have uh, Buckingham Palace in the background. And we've been enjoying the, the colour and the spectacle, along with the solemnity, which has been hugely touching and impressive throughout the afternoon, as the Queen's coffin was processed slowly, um, majestically, uh, to Westminster Hall. And the crowds enjoying the sunshine, enjoying the surroundings, but mindful of what is going on. And lots of them now, of course, going to join the queue. Uh, to file past the, uh, the coffin in Westminster Hall where the Queen's body is lying in state. And uh, that process getting underway very soon. We've seen the queues already uh, all over the bridge and uh, uh, across to the South Bank and the Albert Embankment. Um, two guests with me again. I'm saying welcome back to Sally Osman. Sally, it's lovely to see you again, nice former Director you. of Communications at the Palace, who was telling us earlier that a former office was literally there just at the corner, um, and Lord Boateng, Paul Boateng. Paul, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, former Labour Cabinet Minister, former Ambassador to South Africa, uh, and of course both of you, um, especially you, Paul, with a really good vantage point on the role that the Commonwealth has played. In fact, the old empire evolving into a Commonwealth, and the role that that has played in the, the long reign of the Queen. Um, what is your experience of the way that that evolved? Well, the modern Commonwealth is very much the creation of Her Late Majesty. Uh, she cemented that uh, with her visits, with her political acumen uh, over uh, many, many years. And the visits, the one that I recall particularly, are her visit to Ghana in 1961. She made two visits to Ghana. In 1961, I was a, a schoolboy yeah. uh, waving a flag in the dust by the road. By 1999, I was one, one of her ministers. Mm. And for so many of us in the Commonwealth, you know, her presence, uh, her presence at tough times as well as at happy ones has been crucial. And let me give you an example. Uh, the visit to Ghana was highly problematic in 1961. There were many in both houses who were advising against it and in the press. She was determined to go ahead and she said, look, um, if I don't go and Khrushchev goes, well, that's a triumph for him. Yeah. And it, it is, it's a loss uh, for the Commonwealth. And so she went. My father was at that time a, a cabinet minister, minister of interior and local government, working with Duncan Sands. The security was taken care of. The visit was a success and she touched the hearts of so many people, as she's done all over the Commonwealth. And they're watching today with a lump in their throats because of what she's meant to them. Lots of things we can pick up there, and I'll come to you in a moment, Sally. Um, the issue there about that strategic view, yeah. uh, the thought that, you know, the Soviet Union might be gaining an advantage if she didn't step in, what we call soft power very often, although I'd argue that that's more than soft power in that sense. That's a very clear-sighted strategic view. Um, lots of people will will we'll think that that actually wasn't part of the Queen's makeup at all, but it was. She had a sense of what was right for 
Britain, for the Commonwealth, for her vision of a coming together on a non-racial, non-political basis of states all over the world with shared values. And she knew what was a threat to those values. And let me give you an, another example. Uh, apartheid in South Africa. South Africa suspended from uh, the Commonwealth. Um, the and difficult arguments around sanctions. And the Queen, whilst being strictly non-political, always made it clear through her developing relationship with Nelson Mandela mm. on which side of the argument she stood. She stood for the best of Commonwealth values mm. and the Commonwealth hasn't forgotten that and her legacy to King Charles, who will be a great leader of the Commonwealth, I have no doubt, is a Commonwealth united today in grief, in sorrow, but at the same time a Commonwealth in good shape for the future. Well, that's a good message. And um, Sally, I'm going to come to you just looking at these images, which uh, I think we're all enjoying. And this is the vast space of Horse Guards Parade, of course, and uh, people milling around. The queue, I'm told, the queue to reach the Palace of Westminster is now certainly over four miles long. So it's wow. already growing, and this is, this is day one. Um, this is day one of people being allowed to queue. Um, I actually recognise somebody there from um, <laughs> near where I live. So there you go. Uh, so I've, I've small spotted world. someone already. It's yes. Small um, world. Well, she got there very quickly, didn't she? Um, but this is this is this is the site, isn't it? And this is going to be the dominant theme of the coming days. Um, that there are going to be, well, possibly, well, millions of people, if you add up all the days, yes. who will want to come and see the Queen lying in state, and that tells us a lot about the way that this event and her death has touched people. Um, and of course, they will include people from the Commonwealth, Sally. And I'm just, as we look at these images, from your experience of working at such a close um, uh, range with the Queen in the palace, I'm just thinking, to what extent did Commonwealth issues dominate the day's business? You know, to, to what extent was the Queen engaged actively on an almost daily basis with Commonwealth news and developments? hugely involved. I mean, her private secretaries would be feeding news up to her. She wanted to know what was going on, not just around the UK, but right around the Commonwealth. Mm. She'd be talking to governors general in the realm. She'd be talking to various heads of state. Uh, and so she was very, very connected to the Commonwealth. But it was interesting, as the older she got and she decided she wasn't going to travel as much, the Commonwealth came to her yes. in many respects. Yeah. And there were a couple of very big initiatives that live on. One was the Queen Jung Leaders, which Sir John Major has talked about. It came, that came out of the Diamond Jubilee. 240 astonishing young people who are the future. That was why the Queen was so keen on that project, because it was all about the future and future leaders of the Commonwealth. The Queen's Commonwealth Canopy, which then became the Queen's Green Canopy for the Jubilee, which was another fantastic initiative where land was dedicated to her uh, in perpetuity for her service to the Commonwealth. And other initiatives like the Commonwealth Fashion Exchange, you know, again, very much rooted in appealing to a different kind of demographic, different kind of um, age group, uh, to, to show the kind of the, the breadth of creativity and enterprise right across the Commonwealth. And I would add to that the Queen's Commonwealth Essay Competition. Yes. Uh, because that's a, a wonderful competition that unites young people from all over the Commonwealth. Um, increasingly in recent years, uh, the Queen Consort has been responsible for that. But working with organizations like Book Aid International, where the Duke of Edinburgh was patron, the Queen, Council, the, the Queen Consort now, now is, that was reaching out to a new generation and getting them to think about what the Commonwealth might mean in their lives, mm. but also, and importantly, connecting the Crown with, uh, with them and their lives. The Duke of Edinburgh's award, which the Queen was so supportive mm. of. I mean, I remember her visit to our office's award, award house, and, you know, she was there for the late Duke, just as the late Duke was always there for her. Let's pause for a moment, if we may, because... We're looking at the images there of the Mall, of course, and all of these huge Union flags leading right up to Admiralty Arch. Um, and if you're thinking, oh, there aren't that many people there now, well, no, I can tell you, they've all moved to the south bank of the River Thames. 
um, where for those of you who know the geography of London uh, in any way, the, the queue stretches now to London Bridge. Now that is quite a long way, it's not quite to Tower Bridge, but it's a very long way on the South Bank. So I imagine a queue of quite a few hours for people who are in that, uh, in, in that queue now. So good luck to them all. But uh, on a day like today, it's not so much of a, a burden to stay in this. But anyway, um, my, my good friend and colleague, Alex Jones, uh, a short while ago, caught up with some of the people who are, well, by the looks of it, who are actually quite early in the queue. Oh, Sharon and Michael, so lovely to meet you. Now then, tell me your story. Where are you from and what's brought you down here and into this very long queue? So for me, I'm from Windsor. I grew up there as a child. Um, so the Queen and the Royal Family have been a big part of my life, really. Um, met my husband, Michael. Um, he's in the Royal Navy. and We got married and we now live in Hampshire. Um, we've just been away on holiday and that's when we sadly heard the news. Um, obviously, quite emotional. Um, got back home and we knew the thing that we needed to do was to come here today. Um, so for me personally, it's an honour to be able to do this. Um, she was a queen for so many people and I think she'll always be known as the queen to, to many people really. So today is really important. We were here at 5am. Um, we've met lots of people. It's been emotional. We've had fun, laughter. Yeah. We've talked about our memories and um, what she means to us. And it's just an important thing to do and to be here. Yeah. So you came down last night, didn't you? We did. We did. Yeah. Yeah. So stayed in a hotel. Yeah. And then what were the scenes like here this morning? Then that early, were there, were there people milling about then? Um, we came round of the bridge, and you know we were expecting the queue to be a lot longer. In all honesty, because we were contemplating spending the night out here, but uh, we we took the hotel option instead. So. And what about the people that you've been chatting to? Because you said you've made queue friends, which is now the new term. Yeah, they've been great. We've got lots of people around us that, you know, we don't know each other, um, but now we feel that we do, and we all have a connection, which is the Queen. Um, it's, it's been nice, like I say, we've had people that we've had shared nice thoughts with, um, and everybody feels the same. They're all very emotional, and at the moment, it's, it's, it's okay, and obviously there's going to become a very sombre moment today as the Queen moves on, um, and we will feel that, and I think the world will feel that. Yeah. Um, but as always, we get on and we do the right thing and we'll be there for her and the rest of the royal family. Well, that's lovely, isn't it? And you're going to see lots more of that. People who simply don't know each other at all, they'll spend hours and hours in the queue and they'll be friends for life afterwards. It's a lovely thing um, because, of course, people are all there for the same reason. Uh, it doesn't matter where people are from, what their backgrounds are, how old they are, how young they are. They're all there for one reason, which is that they want to show respect and admiration and affection for the Queen. And that's, uh, that's a very nice thing for us to reflect on. And indeed, with Paul and with Sally, who are still with me, to reflect maybe as well on something that lots of viewers tell us they're interested in. Um, behind the scenes, um, we're used to the Queen with this remarkably sure, certain, constant presence uh, who delivers speeches and we see at the state opening of Parliament and at uh, the birthday parade and all the rest of it. But to do business with the Queen, either as people from the Commonwealth or as, as staff, um, I'm intrigued by that. Mm. How did those exchanges work? Paul, we'll start with you. Well, I mean... I I was a, a, am a, a privy councillor, so I'm not going to talk about what happens mm. in the privy council, but what I can say is her kindness and consideration. Yeah. Because believe you me, when you first become a privy councillor, I think that was for me in 1999, it's huge, you're hugely nervous. Yeah. Uh, and you have to go kneel and you have to kiss her hand, and she just puts you at, at your ease, right. you know, and she, you know, don't worry, it's, it's going to be all, all right. So there's that. But also, I'll never forget this. We had, I had two very dear um, constituents who'd done a lot of work in support of African charitable projects. And I arranged for them to come to an event in the palace. And they were quite elderly and they were a bit overcome. 
and they started talking rather garrulously about their concerns for me. Now I had left the constituency and gone to Africa. Right. And she looked me, she, she smiled at them, and she <laughs> looked me up and down, and she said, well, he doesn't seem to have done too badly, does he? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that put them, everyone burst into yes. laughter, yeah. and, and yeah. they were at their ease. Yeah. But it was that warm, warmth. Yeah. That generosity and spirit and that sense of humour. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned being a Privy Councillor. Mm. Um, I'm just breaking the flow of the conversation for a second. Were you at the Accession Council? No, I wasn't. Right. Okay. Um, because there are more than 600 of us. Only yes. 200 or so could get into the room. Right. There was a ballot and unfortunately I no. wasn't one of the winners. Oh, well. <laughs> but it's, but, it, yeah. but it, it's, it's different, of course, from the ordinary Privy Council. Because mm -hmm. the ordinary Privy Council, six or eight of you are the very most. Yes. Yes. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, they, there is no public. I mean, that's part of it. It is a complete secret. Mm. Yeah. But the formalities of the, the agenda being read and then assent being given, yes. those formalities were replicated right. at the accession uh, uh, Privy Council. Understood. Doing business as a member of staff, dealing with Her Majesty, um, having to maybe explain things that possibly weren't entirely welcome, and especially as Director of Communications, which is a challenging job at the best of times uh, in most places. But at Buckingham Palace, I imagine it carries its own challenges. Indeed. Um, how, how, um, <laughs> very understated, Sally. Um, so how did that work out? Well, I mean, I wouldn't see the Queen every day. I mean, her private secretary certainly did. Um, I wouldn't, but there was a lot of communication, and I would send her memos about various things, explaining how certain things had happened or what might be coming. Every boss likes to know rather than not know. Mm. Um, but the, the, I often think about the first time I ever met her, uh, once I joined her household. Um, and it was at Sandringham. It was on a very grey January day uh, up at Sandringham, and I was pretty nervous. And uh, the Queen's Assistant Private Secretary at the time, Samantha Cohen, was on duty and, and, and brilliant at kind of easing me uh, and easing my nerves. Angela Kelly came down to say hello and ease my nerves, Angela being the Queen's um, personal assistant and dresser. So I went up to meet the Queen with, with, with Sam Cohen and walked into the room. And it was in her, her private kind of office sitting mm. room, all very informal. Um, and I curtsied, trying to not trip over a corgi. Mm. Um, stood up and we talked and she was wonderful because we were talking about a forthcoming uh, state visit to France, how previous state visits had gone and a few anecdotes there. And then she said to me, how was your journey? And I said, well, actually, it was quite cold, ma'am, because there was no heating on the train up to Sandringham. So she said, well, of course, we must give you a rug for the, on the way back. <laughs> and I mean, that's just a very small story, yeah, but her yeah. acts of kindness yeah. to so many members of staff. I mean, the story is a legion. Yeah. I have to say, I probably shouldn't share this, but I, I did. I did actually attend um, one reception here at Buckingham Palace. It's, it's a harmless story in a way, um, and I, I, of course, everyone wants to talk to the Queen. Yeah. Everyone's kind of, you know, jostling for position, um, and I kind of gave up, to be honest. And I went and stood in a little adjoining little corridor, um, and to my shock and terror, who turned up but <laughs> Her Majesty? <laughs> <laughs> and stopped <laughs> and chatted away. We were chatting and it was about 7.30 p.m. Um, I'd taken the night off. I thought, I, who knows when I'll finish at uh, Buckingham Palace. I was not doing the 10 o'clock news. Anyway, we chatted for five minutes and she looked at her watch and she said, you've only got two hours before you're on the news, so you'd better go. <laughs> and off she went. <laughs> I did leave at that point. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, well, look, um, I'm just, it's nice to reflect in that way. It's, it's, even on a day like this, it's nice to smile as well, isn't it? Um, so, as we look at these magnificent uh, images of the Mal, um, I can tell you that Sophie is there enjoying the sunshine. Certainly am. Uh, don't be fooled by these empty pavements behind me. There are still vast numbers of people out here. So many, in fact, they were just... Uh, coming past the palace a short time ago. The police have actually had to stop them. And uh, as you can see, they're all being pushed off into St. James's Park for now before uh, more are allowed to come back. So many people just want to come here and stand here and take photographs and, and just be here on, on this day. Carl Makins is from St. John Ambulance and you've been dealing with all the crowds today, haven't you? How's it been? Yeah, really busy uh, day for us. Um, we've got around uh, 2,000 of our volunteers have signed up to give their time uh, during this really sad period. 
And you've volunteered for St John Ambulance, haven't you, for 35 years. You've been to so many royal events over the years. What was the atmosphere? Describe it today, because you were standing very near Horse Guards Parade. Yeah, so I, yeah, the last time I was stood here, uh, the other side of the road was um, at the Jubilee, um, a really joyous occasion. Um, and today I was stood on the corner of Horse Guards Parade um, and the Mall, and all of a sudden there was this uh, silence uh, within the crowd and you could hear every footstep of everyone within the procession. But that was followed by joy and you could hear people talking about memories of, um, of seeing the Queen or people meeting the Queen or um, past relatives um, having a fondness around uh, the Queen. And you've had, let's say, a lot of interaction with people today. A lot of people have just decided at the last minute to just come here, haven't they? That's right. And, um, and you know, it's, it's a really warm day today. Uh, a lot of people have come dressed for a cold day. Um, we might not have put the right shoes on. We might not have brought enough water and enough uh, food. So, you know, we've got uh, our volunteers across 30 locations um, within the city and, of course, at Windsor as well. And you are going to be looking after the people in that very, very long queue over the next few days. It's already four miles long, probably longer in the few minutes we've been speaking. Uh, what are you expecting? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, 24 hours um, our, our people will be um, supporting and some of that will be first aid. Um, but we're also um, thinking about those that might be stood on their own that have, have, have clearly um, got lots to think about and, and maybe upset about the occasion. And our volunteers are, are trained and on hand um, to support both from a, um, a physical first aid point of view, but all those that just want to listen in uh, and somebody kind to talk to. Huge crowds behind you there, and they're all trying to get past the palace. A lot of people just so keen to be here today, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, you know, a, a really, a really special thing. You know, th three, three jubilees. Um, you know, I've stood in this same spot, and you know, it's, you know, it's, a, it's an experience, um, but it's also a, an opportunity to to pay our respects, but also to say thank you. And everybody having conversations chatting to each other while they were waiting because there were people waiting for hours and hours some even overnight talking about their memories of the Queen when they met the Queen you met the Queen didn't you yeah I was um, really fortunate to meet the Queen back in 2014 at uh, Chatsworth House in, in Derbyshire where um, I live and volunteer um, she spent about six or seven minutes um, talking about um, the work of our volunteers um, across the county around uh, the type of community events that we support um, and how we support our people well, Carl Makers, very good luck with uh, the next few days. I think you're all going to be very, very busy, and thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you very much. appreciate it. Quite rightly, uh, thanking people who are playing such an important part uh, today. Well, that image says it all, doesn't it, really? Uh, there you have the long queue, which is uh, crossing the River Thames to the South Bank. That's Lambeth Bridge, which is very near the Houses of Parliament. And then... Uh, the queue is going all the way down the Albert Embankment, past Westminster Bridge, past Southwark Bridge, all the way down, uh, I'm now told, to London Bridge and beyond. And if it carries on, it'll be down towards Tower Bridge, uh, which will be a very long way away. Um, people have been making a little bit of progress in the last hour because they've been able to come off Lambeth Bridge and, as you can see, walk at a fairly decent pace. But sometimes, because of the way that they're changing the vigils in Westminster Hall, um, it all comes to an abrupt stop for a while, um, and then they move again. So I think the system is that they come over Lambeth Bridge. This is for all of you watching. Uh, there'll be lots of you thinking, well, we're going to join the queue ourselves and come along. So what you'll find is that you're queuing on the South Bank, you'll come over Lambeth Bridge, where these people are, and turning to the right. And then when you get to what we call Victoria Garden, uh, which is on Millbank, this little area of parkland here, which is right on the Thames, um, there you'll be in that kind of Gatwick Airport type of arrangement, um, where you're coming through the, the zigzag queue. Um, which I'm told is a very efficient way of doing it, and I'm sure it is. And then you'll come out of that to the Houses of Parliament themselves. So when you're in this section, you're almost there. You're within reach. Um, and then, of course, you can prepare yourselves for that solemn moment when you enter Westminster Hall and you are able to walk past the uh, coffin and uh, you're able to see the Imperial State Crown, the orb and scepter, and the vigil being maintained um, by members of the uh, armed forces and of course you'll be supervised by parliamentary staff so it'll be a very special experience indeed. In the meantime let's join my colleague JJ once again.
I'm here with Major Johnny Hathaway. Why, uh, uh, Wellington Barracks is a bit of a hive of activity as people uh, kind of recover from what's just happened and get ready for the next phase. Can I ask you, sir, first of all, w what has your role been today? Um, I've been very privileged as the captain of the Queen's Company, the Queen's personal company within the Grenadier Guards, to present back to her the Queen's Company colour royal standard of the regiment, which is a very oversized, uh, essentially, battle flag of, of yesteryear, which is... Uh, granted to the regiment by the sovereign uh, on their accession to the throne is never touched, never changed, never repaired and is laid up um, on their demise. And uh, today I was fortunate, privileged and honoured enough to lay it on the catafalque uh, to present it back to the sovereign it served. I mean, can you put your sort of thoughts during that in, into words? It's very difficult. It's very difficult. And um, it means it's the beating heart of, of, of the regiment is our duty to our sovereign and to our nation and when you think of the conflicts that Grenadier Guardsmen have fought in across the years and even in the last 70 years that Her Majesty has seen all of that uh, passion, emotion, loyalty and dedication is vested in that single colour so it's more than a piece of fabric, it's more than embroidery, it is the representative heart of the regiment and our, and our connection personally to the sovereign uh, and to hand that back to her was a huge privilege. Wow, uh, I've heard a lovely anecdote going around, although you are a major uh, you, you're referred to as the captain. Why is that? Yeah, it's a peculiarity, isn't it? And it causes great confusion. Um, so when the regiment was formed by King Charles II back in 1656, uh, he uh, had his loyal followers in exile in Bruges and he formed a, a lifeguard of, of foot and he reserved for himself, for his own command, the first company. And it became known as the King's Own and it was gifted in executive authority to the captain lieutenant. And 366 years later, um, we are still the captain uh, of the Queen's Company uh, as the sovereign is the company commander. And in fact, I'm, um, I'm Her Majesty's 43rd and last captain of her company. Phenomenal. Uh, a remarkable day, but I think particularly remarkable to think that actually you were in Iraq, what, three days ago? That's right. When the sad news uh, came through, uh, the Queen's Company, 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards, is deployed on operations in the Middle East. And there's no truer uh, evidence of, of the dual roles of the foot guards and the whole of the household division as uh, our being flown back through a predetermined and well-executed plan should, th should this sad eventuality come to pass. And within, uh, within 24 hours, we were, we were rehearsing. And uh, that goes for the bearer party, uh, the escorts, and key personalities within the company, like myself, um, to come back and, and, and honour our, our, uh, our company commander. Wow. And so soldiers first. Indeed, soldiers first. Um, but this is a, a sad but proud and, and equally important duty for us. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for speaking to me and uh, go well with the rest of the, the, the ceremonies to come. Thanks, JJ. Uh, many thanks to JJ. And uh, uh, yet another guest who's really kind of uh, allowed us to understand a little more about how the event today has been put together, how it's worked, because it involved uh, a lot of hard work over many years. Um, before we chat to Robert and Katie, who have joined me once again in the studio, I thought we might want to reflect on uh, how the events unfolded. And let's take a look at this and maybe listen to some of the music for just a few moments. The Imperial State Crown, which was glittering in the sunshine. And the colours were so bold and vibrant. The music was glorious, majestic, a deep beat which we could feel in the air around us. And then, of course, followed by the King and the senior members of the royal family. And it was a very memorable moment as they made their way along the Mall. Now, within moments, we think that over at Westminster Hall, the, uh, the doors will be opened for the public to gain access uh, and to be able to see uh, the remarkable solemnity of that uh, scene in Westminster Hall. Just take a look at this. It's magical. This ancient space built in 1097, William Rufus, which has seen so many events of celebration and turbulence over the centuries. And this is the space in which 
the Queen's body is lying in state. Because what's happened today is that the royal household has transferred this responsibility to the state. And Petro Trelawney is there. We're just a couple of minutes away from the first members of the public being allowed into Westminster Hall. You left us here an hour or so ago, and for, what, 15 minutes afterwards, politicians from Westminster, the Scottish Parliament, the Senate, the Welsh Parliament, and the Northern Ireland Assembly filed slowly past the beer, its purple cloth, supporting the late Majesty's coffin along with the politicians, parliamentary staff and loyal and devoted members of the Queen's household. As they passed, some bowed their head, some crossed themselves, some said a silent prayer, others wiped away a tear. Then once the invited guests had left the hall, Black Rod closed the doors and for 45 minutes or so, this ancient space was prepared for the arrival of members of the public. The crown jewellers place the orb and scepter on top of the coffin, the sovereign's orb and scepter commissioned for the coronation of Charles II in 1661 and used at all subsequent coronations. Representation of the sovereign's power, the cross on the orb representing Christ's dominion over the world sits there alongside the imperial state crown and that arrangement of flowers some from Balmoral some from Windsor the duty officer bangs his stick twice to signal a change of the guard the yeoman of the guard and the gentleman at arms make their way into the centre of Westminster Hall. They will be on duty around the clock between now and Monday morning. And the coffin is carried to Westminster Abbey for the funeral. These ancient orders of royal bodyguards will be joined by members of the Royal Company of Archers, the Queen's bodyguard in Scotland, who we saw on duty when Her Majesty's coffin rested in St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh. The airmen of the guard, retired soldiers and non-commissioned officers from all branches of the British Armed Services, sharing duties with them officers from the regiments of the household division four at a time one standing on each corner of the coffin members of the household cavalry and later they will hand responsibility to the grenadier guards the coldstream guards and the welsh irish and scottish guards Police officers on each corner too, wearing their number one ceremonial uniform. this change of personnel guarding the coffin is complete I think we're going to see the first members of the public allowed in Black Rod striding through Westminster Hall first female Black Rod in the 650 year old history of the job 
she has played a major role in the organization of the events we've seen so far here at Westminster Hall. A thumbs up there from a member of parliamentary staff, which I think we mean, means we must be very close to the, the doors being opened. As we were saying earlier on last night, Her Majesty rested at Buckingham Palace, her last night in the residence that she knew throughout her 96 years. Focus of private family grief. But that now changes to public grief, as her subjects have the chance to pay their respects. Or as many as three quarters of a million people may pass through here between now and the state funeral on Monday. Well, some of the people that we're seeing coming in now have been queuing for two nights, waiting to ensure their place very front of the line of those anxious to spend a moment walking around the coffin. this means to each and every person here. <coughs> Respect for the monarch. Perhaps also transference of personal grief. And a deep sympathy for the monarch's children that shared experience of losing parents that many of us will know. have just made a short journey to be here from London and its suburbs. Others have traveled much further. I've heard accounts of people who have made long international flights in order to be here. One person saying that they'd known Her Majesty the Queen, that she'd been part of their life for all their life, that they wanted to come here to pay final respects and end what they considered their shared story. So from now until Monday morning, the people will come here, will file past the beer with Her Majesty's coffin resting on top. BBC is launching a live stream of the lying in state for people who are unable to be here and want to pay their respects virtually. It's available now on the BBC homepage, on the BBC news website and app, on the iPlayer, the red button, and also on the BBC Parliament channel. And that live stream will be on air all the time that members of the public are allowed into Westminster Hall, night and day, as they come to pay their respects to Queen Elizabeth II.
Petrock, thank you very much. Petrock Trelawney there for us uh, inside uh, Westminster Hall as the first members of the public uh, are being allowed in to pay their respects. They've been waiting patiently for several hours. With me in the studio, just for some closing thoughts after such a memorable afternoon, a moving afternoon, uh, Robert Hardman and uh, Katie Nichols still with me. And Robert, we were earlier just seeing the images of the procession. What was the impression that made on you? I thought it was absolutely faultless and inspiring and I think uh, impossible to have watched it without feeling immense pride um, uh, and, and the great poignancy. I mean, there were there were her, her, her family, obviously the, 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 the children walking behind. Also, uh, everyone in that procession had reason to be incredibly honoured and touched to be there because they all had a connection with her. It was yeah. so nice to see some of her her closest staff, her, her, her pages, her palace steward, um, all the, 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 the heads of all her households at the palace. I mean, they all know, knew her terribly well. And, and right alongside the coffin, I thought it was very sweet that there were uh, her equerries, yeah. um, the people who, from the forces, who would spend three years at a time um, working really closely with her. She loved her equerries, and uh, they're all there. Katie? It was just perfect in every way. Of course, it's a, it is a moment that has been rehearsed many times and planned for many years. We've seen a contingency plan put into place. Um, but you can never guarantee absolutely everything. But it was just perfect. And I think you can imagine the Queen looking down and being very, very pleased with how today played out. It's good to have you both with us. Thank you very much, Robert and Katie. And thanks to all of our guests who joined us today. It's been a very moving afternoon, dignified and solemn, some uplifting moments as well. Uh, but the Queen's body is now lying in state in Westminster Hall and, of course, uh, ahead of the uh, state funeral, which takes place on Monday. But from all of us here, the BBC team at Buckingham Palace, goodbye. Now, passing under the Great Arch for the last time, Queen Elizabeth II. Cortege now passing the statues of King George VI and Queen Mother. Members of the royal family now saluting as they pass the cenotaph.